Irreconcilable differences? Killed on your wedding night. Even for Vegas, that's a quickie marriage. Well, it's like the priest says, Till death do you part. This that new hotshot they hired to replace you? Hotshot? Yeah. Replace me? <laughs> Come on. Nick Stokes, glad to get a chance to work with you. Well, I'll leave you to it. Well, if you're as good as they say, you probably already noticed our blushing bride here. Well, judging by the murder weapon and those cuts across her face and neck, my money's on crime of passion. The groom's missing. That might be a lethal case of cold feet or maybe a jealous ex-boyfriend. And if that's the case, somewhere, our groom might be a second victim. Yeah, the autopsy will tell us more. Just let Doc Robbins know when you're gonna want the body brought down to the morgue. She's just Jane Doe for now. I didn't find a purse, an ID, or any luggage in the room. We could be looking at the trifecta. Kidnapping, robbery, and murder. So, right now we need to find out who this girl is. Because if this is a crime of passion, then our victim knew her killer. Not specifically. Let's get back to it. Hey, do me a favor, will you? Could you finish up the interview with our witness over there? Then you can help me finish processing the scene. It's a busy night. We're shorthanded. Oh, and Jim left us a copy of the 911 call. It might be worth a listen. Empty. If anyone used the hot tub last night, they took the time to drain it. There's some kind of glass or plastic lodged in her neck. Could be the COD, but we'll need Doc Robbins to make that call. We'll want a closer look at it after he takes it out. With any luck, our victim's DNA will be in CODIS, and we'll find out who she is. From the distribution of this blood, it looks like she was standing when she was attacked, then she fell onto the bed. Good catch. The carpet does look a little bleached out in that spot. Looks like someone tried to clean up. Interesting. We'll take that back to the lab and see what trace analysis can tell us. Careful there. Don't want to shake up all the evidence. Unless we shake out something we didn't know was there. This broken piece resembles the piece of glass that was used to stab the victim. Somehow, maybe in a struggle, it wound up all the way across the room here. Hey, you see how that cushion on the couch was put on backwards? Check it out. Blood could be from either our perp or our victim. All we know is, somebody didn't want us to see it.
Lots of blood in this sink. Makes sense. That much blood spatter, the killer would have been a mess. Great job. Pays to be thorough. I don't see a faucet. How do you feel the... Oh, I see. Cute. I don't see a faucet. How do you feel the... Oh, I see. Cute. Yeah, uh, Charles Steer. I'm the night manager. Sorry if I'm a little freaked out. This, this is a first for me. Okay, okay. Uh, th that was just after checkout time, ar ar around 11. I, I came by to see if he'd left so that the maid could come in here and clean up. I, I knocked a couple times, no answer. I, I, opened, the, I opened the door and uh, I saw her. I, I, I called you guys right away. Uh, yeah, right. He's some Mexican dude. I never seen him before. Short guy, you know, about five, six or so. He, he checked in by himself, but I figured he, he might have had some company waiting around the corner because he asked for the Cupid suite, you know? You know, I kind of went all through this with that Captain Brass guy earlier. But anyway, Ombre paid with cash. He gave a phony name like Michael Jordan or George Lopez or something. You know, most guys do. No. <laughs> You kidding me? The owner, she don't trust nobody who works here. Cash goes straight into the drop safe. Do not pass go, you know what I mean? She picks it up first thing in the morning. She takes it straight to the bank as soon as it opens. Nah, see, I, I kind of make my own rules on the night shift. I just write down the name, take the cash, or run the card. I mean, it's not like I get paid enough to pay attention, you know what I'm saying? No, man. Yeah, I've never seen her before. Could you let me know if you find out? Because I, I kind of like to know. That is, I mean, if you're allowed to give out that sort of information at all? No, not at all. I mean, it was, it was a pretty quiet night. Unusually quiet, you know what I mean? And if anybody was screaming or fighting or anything in here, I mean, nobody said a word to me about it. Whoa, whoa, okay. I don't know nothing about that. You understand? And I know it couldn't have been one of our maids, because I gotta tell them when they can come in here, you know what I'm saying? So that's that's gotta be, you know, the, the bad guy doing that. Well, I, I can't think of anything else to tell you, man. It's, it's just a messed up world we're living in, that's for sure. When you're done processing, we'll head back to the lab. But I'll have Brass hold the scene, just in case we need to come back for anything. Be sure to finish up with our witness. He may be the only one we have. I'll call Doc Robbins down in the morgue and have him send someone out for the body. Hi, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. I'm Al Robbins. It's nice to meet you. No, in fact, the marriage was not consummated at all, consensually or otherwise. Well, at least not last night. Have you met Henry Andrews in talks yet? Very nice fellow. You'll like him. Well, anyway, according to the tox panel, your victim's blood alcohol level was 0.09. She was definitely inebriated. But even if she held her liquor well, I would imagine there had to be some kind of complication with the 1.9 milligrams per liter of benzoyl methyl econine in her system. Still, that could be considered by some to be a fairly recreational level of cocaine ingestion. I'd say your victim's been dead about eight to nine hours, which I suppose would put the murder at around three in the morning. A broken heart. Seriously, I removed a shard of broken glass from what looks like it could be a heart-shaped plate or ashtray. It severed the victim's carotid artery, which led to her cause of death being technically exsanguination. But where's the poetry in that? The shard is right over... Oh, here you go. Yes, I have them right here for you.
Well, I haven't completed my examination, so I might find out something else. Please feel free to poke around some more now, or you can come back anytime. Good catch. Your victim wore a removable partial denture. It's pretty nice bridge work, actually. But you ask me, this girl's too young to be losing her teeth. My experience tells me she's probably been the victim of domestic violence. That's another piece of broken glass that looks like what was used to stab our Vic. Let's find as many of these broken pieces as we can, and then we'll try to put them back together at the lab. You're making a great team already. Crime scene process that fast, huh? Our new transfer here moves pretty quick. I just stand back and watch the magic happen. Well, don't stand around too much. You still need to identify that Jane Doe before you can make much headway. We're on it. Sodium bicarbonate, citrate, silicate, anionic and non-ionic surfactants. Fragrance. They equal your common, everyday carpet cleaner. Unfortunately, there's no way to determine when it was used, so it won't help us narrow down the timeline. Blood from the couch cushion is not a match to our Jane Doe, and someone tried to clean it up. So, if we go with our crime of passion theory, our victim struggles with the assailant, but she gets a piece of him. And obviously, he doesn't want to be identified, so as best he can, he cleans up after himself. Well, we do have someone else's blood at the scene. Problem is, it's just a couple of drops, which could easily have been left there by some previous guest. Nice work. Those ID markers are often better than driver's licenses. Now all we have to do is look it up in the medical database. We're going to want to match up all the pieces of glass we can find.
Yeah, um, m m my name is Charles Steer, and, and I'm calling to report a murder. I I I'm, the I'm the night manager at Aurelia's Fantasy Suites over on West Alexander Street. Please hurry. Sir, is the victim a hotel guest? I, I, I don't know exactly. She, uh, she's in there in the Cupid suite. Jeez, there's just a lot of blood. Um, look, I really need the cops to get here as soon as possible. I'll wait for them in the parking lot, okay? This, this is really freaking me out. Sir, if you could please stay on the line with me a while. Jackpot says here our corpse bride's real name is Lynn Bowder, and she isn't a newlywed at all. She's been married for over a year to a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Yeah, but get this, under spouse's employee contact information, Lynn lists a military FPO address, a fleet post office box. It's good for another two months, which means her husband's still deployed overseas. Which begs the question, if Lynn's husband is out of the country, then who's she honeymooning with? I got you some more information on Lynn Bowder. She's a Vegas native, but moved out to North Carolina a couple of years ago after getting married. Six months ago, her husband, along with the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, was redeployed to Iraq. Now, as far as I can tell, the two remain happily married. There's no record of divorce either here or in North Carolina. No new marriage license was issued to Lynn Bowder. None of the local chapels has any record of her walking or running down the aisle. And none of the hotels has any record of her having checked in. Got a last known local address? No, but her last local place of employment was Pleasure City, a strip club about two blocks away from Aurelia's Fantasy Suites. We should check it out. We? <laughs> Call me if you need backup. Will do. Hey. Yeah, one of the homicide detectives from Day Shift is having a retirement party tomorrow. I got saddled with picking up a gift from Night Shift. That's Lieutenant Briggs, right? Hasn't she been with the force for something like 35 years? Almost to the day. And when the first female African-American detective in the department retires, you better believe they're making a big deal out of it. Not too bad. Busy day. You know how it is. Let me know if you identify a suspect. Pleasure City sort of redefines the concept of civic duty. Hey, sorry, we're closed. Ma'am, we're here from the Vegas Crime Lab. We're here following up on a murder investigation. Kathy, Kathy Bird, you said murder. Who got murdered? Yeah, guy last night got a little grabby. Security bounced him. He's lucky that's all they did. Hurt like a son of a bitch. Lynn Bowder? Yeah, why? I'm afraid she was found dead at Aurelia's Fantasy Suites. Oh my god! I, I just saw her last night! Yes, it was. We were both working. She spent most of her time dancing for this one guy. Well, I didn't get a real good look at him because the club was busy and it was dark as hell and I was working. I think he was Mexican though, not real tall. And she was like grinding all over the guy. I mean, he must have had some serious cash on him. Like I said, I can't remember exactly, but I think she was in that chair over there. The one turned away from the stage, she liked to have room to dance. Wow, I'm gonna guess midnight? 
They left together sometime around midnight, but I'm not 100% on that. Not real well. I mean, you know, she used to work here a few years ago. We used to hang out some, but then she got married to a real loser and left town. Anyway, I didn't hear from her until two weeks ago. She called and came by the club. You know, she said she wanted to work the pole here for a few nights, make a little quick and dirty cash. Well, yeah, we were kind of close back then. She really wanted to move back to Vegas. Her marriage to the Marine hit the rocks. She finally got smart and left the son of a bitch. And it's like I said, she wanted to come back here and make some money. She thought I could put in a good word for her with the management, and I did. Did she have any enemies? A jealous ex-boyfriend, maybe. Lynn? She was her own worst enemy. No, I mean, Lynn was a really cool person and all, but she wasn't always the most reliable person, if you know what I mean. Me? Are you kidding? No frickin' way. I wouldn't set foot in that dump. That place is pathetic. Not even last night. <laughs> Look, last night I was here till, like, dawn, and then I went straight home. I was exhausted. You try serving drinks all night in six-inch heels. Married? I really don't think so. I mean, she was still married to Buzzcut in Baghdad, and that was a total train wreck, so... I can't really see her going all big love on me and taking home husband number two. No, not really, but you know, if I remember something, I'll be sure to give you guys a call, okay? Good luck with everything. We appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions. There are probably plenty of prints on those poles, but they're not the ones we want. Let's try to narrow our search parameters as much as possible. We don't want to get swamped with useless prints. So where's the most likely area for Lynn to have danced for this fellow? All right, now we might be getting somewhere. This palm print means someone was forced to sit on his hands last night. Now, from what I hear, that's not exactly the M.O. of a local dancer. Keep going. We have to check the whole chair. It's Jim Brass. Somebody tried to use Lynn Bowder's credit card in an ATM off Eastern. Swing by my office when you get a chance. Okay. We're looking at a lot of prints in here, my friend. Finding a connection to Lynn Bowder might seem like we're looking for a needle in a haystack, but... You know, that's exactly what it is. Well, hell, that's why they pay us the big bucks, am I right? Got one. Lots more chair to search, though. Another one. Great. All right. We've been over every inch of that chair. Watching your technique? I'm pretty sure we found what there is to find. Yeah? There you are. Let me know what you find. Not too bad. Busy day. You know how it is. Let me know if you identify a suspect. Okay, so, we know Lynn Bowder was a Pleasure City last night. The question still remains, who was she with?
Mr. Iram Dominguez. That's quite a rap sheet. Mr. Iram Dominguez's prints are a match to those we found with Lynn Bowder's prints. And this guy definitely has a history of violence. His current address is in Los Angeles, California. He might have already skipped town. We need brass to put out a bullet on his vehicle right now. Okay. Well, what the patrons of Pleasure City don't know can't hurt them, I guess. Two-year-old stripper? Wow, man, I think somebody really needs to think about hanging up the old G-string. What do you need? I'll see what I can do. Show me the evidence. You got Dominguez's prints at Pleasure City, where Lynn Bowder was working. And the night manager's description of the guy who checked into the Cupid suite last night seems to fit Dominguez pretty well. So he's definitely a person of interest. I just don't think a judge is going to issue a warrant for you. But I'll tell you what I can do. I'll put out a bolo on the guy and try to pick him up for questioning. So in the meantime, you can do me a favor and show Dominguez's photo to either of our witnesses. It would be nice to know if one of them recognizes him as the person they saw last night.
Charles Steer? Looks like our hotel manager has some splaining to do. You still here? Huh? Oh, yeah. Just, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, what, what a thing to see. You guys must be used to it, though, huh? What? Really? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, well, okay. So the thing is, she was gonna, like, pay for the room when they were checking in, you know? And so she gave me the card to run, but then the guy, the guy, he, he, he like, pulled out a wad of cash and said he wanted to pay, so, you know, of course, I, I, I let him. I didn't. Yeah, no, uh, I didn't. That's right, uh, I didn't, cause <laughs> I wasn't really thinking good at that moment. <laughs> And I was going to call you guys back, y you know, to tell you that I'd been pretty much up all night working. And I forgot to mention the lady checking in w w with the Mexican dude. I can imagine you had a pretty rough night. Cocaine has a way of doing that to you, Charlie. Cocaine? What? What? No, man. I mean, I, I mean, I used to. All right. But no, no, not now. I don't I don't do it. No. You know, I'm like I'm a clean, right? Pure of mind and body and all that. But I got... Now I got these, uh, these serious allergies, man. I, I, I gotta take something for them. You, you don't got anything on you, do you? <laughs> no? No. Sorry, Charlie. Y yeah, that's, that's the dude, man. That's, that's the Mexican. I mean, the dude who, you know, checked in with the dead lady last night. That's, that's him, I swear. So there's a, there's not like a reward or something, is there? Well, I got some good news for you. Just picked up Iron Dominguez standing on the edge of I-15 trying to solicit a ride out of town, which is technically illegal in Nevada. So on top of that, Mr. Dominguez is in violation of his parole for domestic battery back in the Golden State. So he'll be staying with us for a few more days if you'd like to come down and have a chat with him. Brass has Dominguez in custody? Score one for the bolo. Now we ought to be on the lookout for a way to tie him to the murder. Let's see what he has to say for himself. Came to sell my truck. How much you get for it? Couple G's, I guess. Not bad. It buys you a pretty good night at Pleasure City. Pleasure City? Yeah, sure. You trying to ask me if I was there last night? Is that a crime, officer? Yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. I go for the booze, not the names. Well, is that why you took Lynn to Aurelia's Fantasy Suites? But maybe by that point you'd blown the two G's. Lynn wasn't giving up anything for free. And you weren't going to take no for an answer. You two get into it, and you put an end to it by stabbing her in the throat. Am I right? Jeez, man, are you crazy? What the hell are you talking about? I came in to sell my truck, I sold my truck. Then I went to the strip club. I had some beers, bought some dances. Then I decided to go home. End of story. So what? You ain't going to find nobody who said they saw me kill that chick. And you know why? Because I am innocent. I didn't do nothing. But if you want to throw my Latino ass in jail, you better come correct. Because I'm going to find me a very good lawyer to sue all your asses. You feel me? Mr. Dominguez, with or without a lawyer, your hitchhiking arrest lets us take your DNA. Open your mouth, please. That's not going to be a problem. We have Mr. Dominguez's overnight bag in the property room. I got rolled just walking down the street, right after I left Pleasure City. I mean, you guys got a very dangerous city here, I'm telling you. Bastard got all the money I had left. That's why you picked me up hitchhiking on the side of I-15. Which, you know, it would have been nice if somebody let me know is like totally illegal. What is it? Is that a club? It's the hotel where Lynn Bowder was found murdered. Hey now, there's no way you can put that on me. I never been to any fantasy suites. You got no proof that's my blood. We'll take this up again once we've found some solid evidence. 
What, you got a problem with my English? Permítame hablar español. No! I never been to any fantasy suites. You got no proof that's my blood? I thought you were supposed to be good. Well, take it easy, man. I'm no killer. I never touched that ashtray. Hello there, I don't believe we've met. I'm Dr. Raymond Langston. Working on some fingerprints there, Doc? One fingerprint in particular, actually. I managed to pull a partial off a cannoli form that might be our murder weapon. But I don't think there are enough identifiable minutiae to make a match. Care to take a crack at it? did it. Thank you. You just helped me solve this case. Hiram Dominguez's DNA matches one of the blood samples we found at the crime scene. stuck to the shirt. Nice find. Like I told you, I never been to any fantasy suites. We found your blood at the scene of the crime. You lied to us. Care to revise your statement? Jeez. Oh, Come on, man. I didn't kill her. I don't know what happened, okay? Yeah, I took both ladies back to the fantasy suites. We got a room, we got it going on. There's just no way, man, that I could have killed her. Yeah, it was the redhead's idea. She said they was roommates or something, said they like to share. Like I'm gonna say no to that. Kathy Bird has red hair. Did you hear any names? For the blonde, I didn't, but I think she called the redhead Cat. 
I guess the cat is out of the bag. I'm gonna find Kathy Bird's address. The wedding dress? Oh man, it's stupid. It's like I told the girls I was getting divorced. That's why I was selling my truck and spending all the money. Cause I promise you, I ain't giving that nagging bitch one dime. Anyway, the redhead brought the wedding dress over to the hotel, even got a tux for me. She said they were gonna give me a divorce party I never forget. It was pretty sweet for a while. Yeah, well, it's all fun and games until someone loses their life. It was all going pretty good until I ran out of money, right? Then that red-haired bitch tried to kick me out of the damn room that I paid for. And I was like, no way, I'ma get what I got coming. Sure, because you earned it, right? That's right, that's what I said. So I stepped to Blondie to see what's up. And yeah, okay, I admit that I had been partaking of some alcoholic beverages and... I may have snorted some coke. But red hair bitch get all up in my face first. She's screaming and pushing and punching on me, saying, get out, get out. And I just defended myself. I think I just shoved her back a bit. And then when I turn around to, you know, apologize to Blondie, boom, lights went out. And I don't remember a damn thing after that. You regained consciousness, and you saw Lynn Bowder lying there in a pool of her own blood. Is it that hard to dial 911? I woke up. I see her lying there, dead. I couldn't remember a damn thing about what happened. I didn't know what was going on. Truth is, I got a record and all I thought was, who the hell's gonna believe me? Don't worry, Mr. Dominguez. The truth might just set you free. ATM card? I know nothing about that, for real. Like I told you, I never touched that ashtray. What's your point? That don't prove anything. All right, maybe it's time we took a break to regroup. I know you're new to Vegas, but come on, you gotta have evidence before you convict someone. Let's see if you can find something before you go back in there. may be able to get some DNA off that. We have Kathy Bird's blood at the crime scene. This will be enough for that warrant. Yeah? What evidence do we have? You found Kathy Bird's DNA at the crime scene. Means she lied. And that's the probable cause we need to get a warrant to search her apartment. And if we find anything there that ties her to Lynn's murder, we know where to come for the arrest warrant.
Miss Bird, we're from the crime lab. We have a warrant to search your apartment. You need to open up. All right, keep your pants on. I'm coming. Now, Miss Bird. Well, if I'd known this was a social call, I would have made some of my finger sandwiches. Hey, yeah. <laughs> it is a very small world, yes it is. Well, uh, I don't want to get in your way here, so uh, I should go. Hey, hey, see you later, cat. Call me, huh? It's like you said, we're friends. That a problem? Why would I visit him at work? I don't know about you, but my boss gets pissed if I socialize when I'm on the job. No, Lynn wasn't staying here. Who told you that? I have no idea where she was staying. You know, I've done nothing but cooperate with you. And now, I think it's about time you take whatever it is you're gonna take, and please just leave. Wow. I've met junkies with cleaner apartments. That plant might be more healthy if the window wasn't boarded up. Vegas gets cold at night. Not bad. Painting supplies and makeup on the same table? Looks like an accident waiting to happen to me. I don't think I'd brush my teeth in the same sink I used to clean my paintbrushes. Looks like a fair amount of blood in that drain. Somehow, I thought there'd be more shoes. And look here. Another chunk of glass. Looks a lot like the others we found. Check out this footprint. Notice anything odd? Like how something right there has broken up the tread pattern? Looks like he's got something stuck in his shoe.
The blood we found in Kathy Bird's apartment matches Lynn Bowder. You know, honestly, Lynn's blood at Kathy's place wouldn't be that suspicious if it weren't for the fact that Kathy seems to have a real problem telling us the whole truth. What do you need? Show me what you've got. The problem here is, I don't see how these things are connected. Do you have enough evidence? Looks like Kathy Bird isn't telling us everything. I'll have the judge issue the warrant. All right, Miss Bird. We know you were at Aurelia's last night. Why don't you tell us what happened? I already told you. I worked late at Pleasure City, and then I went straight home. But somehow your DNA took a detour to the Cuban suite? Strange. Perhaps you'd care to try again. Once more. With feeling? Geez, all right, I was there. I just didn't want the hassle from you guys, but... Whatever. Look, I'm not supposed to dance for customers outside the club. It's a strict policy. My boss will fire me when he finds out. But this Dominguez guy had a lot of cash, because he sold his car or truck or something, and he's leaving his wife, yada, yada, yada. You don't need to spare us the details. Lynn and I agreed to give the guy a two-girl show at the hotel, but the guy ran out of money. So I was like, Lynn, let's bounce. But she started to have a thing for the guy. <laughs> I don't know. I just wanted to get the hell out of there, so I went home. That's the God's honest truth. Why do you need that? Shouldn't you be looking for the killer? This is a total waste of time. Lynn was still with that guy when I took off. I left before he slashed her. How do you explain the glass shard in your room? Look, I'm not the only one who comes to my apartment, all right? Anybody could have dragged a piece of glass in. I didn't put it there. Me? I'm not the one you should be talking to. I never even touched that ashtray. Like I said, I left before he slashed her. I left, she was still alive and well. How do you explain Lynn's blood in your shower? You guys are reaching here. I'm not even a lawyer and I could say, well, she cut herself. Or it was that time of the month. Or you guys planted evidence. Pick any one of those, why don't you? All right, cut the attitude. You've done nothing but lie to us from word one. So I think the district attorney is going to want to throw in a couple of obstruction charges on top of first-degree murder. You're at the hotel, and you clean Lynn's blood off you when you got home. You thought if you just washed it down the drain, no one would know the difference. You probably didn't realize you still had a piece of the murder weapon on your clothes. Well, welcome to the wonderful world of forensic science, lady. I really hope you enjoy the rest of your life in prison. Wait, wait! I was... I was there when Lynn was killed, but, but I swear to God it wasn't me. It was Charlie. Charlie killed her. 
And he said he'd kill me too if I told anyone. Okay, so we're partying. But then this Dominguez guy, like I told you, he totally runs out of cash. And I'm like, party's over, dude. And, you know, I say, Lynn, let's get out of here. But dude's not taking last call for an answer, and he starts getting rough, you know? And we get into it. Then Charlie comes running in, and he, he hits the guy in the head with a damn ashtray. Totally knocks him out. Now... I know Charlie because I've been to the suites a few times before, but maybe he was high or something. Because he started yelling at me and Lynn, he wanted all her cash and drugs and booze, and I mean, he even tried to take her purses. Let me guess. Lynn didn't want to give up her purse. That's right. I gave up mine, but Lynn wouldn't. Charlie went crazy. He picked up a chunk of that broken ashtray and he... Oh my God! I loved Lynn. She was my friend. She didn't deserve that. So when you called the police... Oh, wait, that's right. You didn't call the police. Charlie said he'd kill me if I went to the cops. He said I'd get it worse than Lynn, and then he told me he'd cover for both of us. He'd just make it look like the Dominguez guy did it. Here, my cell phone. He left me a voicemail. Listen to it yourself if you don't believe me. I never even touched that ashtray. Hey, Cat. I'm calling because... Well, because you, you and I both know what happened last night was no accident, right? So I just want you to know, you better keep your promise, all right? That way, I keep mine, and we're cool, okay? Okay. That's it. What do you think? It sounds like a threat, but... I just have a hard time imagining Charlie really intimidating Kathy. I would think, if anything, it would be the other way around, but I suppose anything's possible. Let's see what Brass thinks. Hey. I'm going to need to see some evidence before I go to a judge. Well, appearances might be deceiving, but that sounds like Charlie Steer has something to confess. I'll see what I can do. Mr. Steer, we heard the message you left on Kathy Bird's cell phone. Oh, you gotta be kidding. She, she played it for you, didn't she? Damn it! Well, if it's any consolation, our threat seemed a little more convincing than yours. W what did she tell you? Something about how badly you needed a purse and how you stab Lynn Bowder in the throat to get one. What?! You don't look like much, Charlie. So I get it. After you left the voicemail, you wanted to make absolutely sure Kathy understood you weren't playing games. So you paid her a little visit. You know, it's just bad luck that we were there at the apartment when you did. No! Look, look, you got it all wrong, man! I didn't kill that girl! Cat killed her! My what? You know, your limos, your kicks. Isn't that what the kids are calling them these days? Hand them over, Charlie. Oh, you gotta be... Okay, fine. I just wanted to talk to her. Jeez. But she blows me off, then you guys show up. I step right in the mud. your classic he said she said yeah but cat called me to the room man that's how it went down and and that blonde chick i mean she was already lying there on the bed she was dead when i walked in there man you gotta believe me manipulating evidence isn't usually what you want to do if you're innocent what are you talking about i didn't clean up the crime scene
Charlie was pretty twitchy. I wonder if he dropped some of his stash. I think you just found the missing piece to this puzzle. Nice work. We should be able to get that print now. There you go. Good as new. Carpet cleaner. We found traces of identical carpet cleaner on both the floor of the crime scene and on Charlie Steer's shoe. I thought he said cleaning was the maid's job. You gotta love it when you pull a fingerprint off the murder weapon. Now, let's hope we get a match. Print proves Kathy Bird handled the murder weapon. We got her. What are you talking about? I didn't clean up the crime scene. I'd say you cleaned up to make yourself look less guilty. No, no way. That, that's not how it happened. I, I did help clean up, but Cat killed that blonde! So instead of calling the cops, you helped her cover up a murder? Why should we believe that? Ah, oh, cuz... Cuz I love her, man, okay? It's, it's crazy, I know. Cat comes to the hotel all the time with all kinds of dudes, and we have this kind of... Well, uh, arrangement. I give her the room off the books, and she kicks me back some cash from her dates. Sometimes she even gives me... Well, you know, like I said, we have an arrangement, man. So that's why Dominguez didn't have to register? <sighs> yeah, I'll admit it. I, I, I confess. I stole from the hotel. Great. But I swear on my grandmother's grave, I did not kill that chick. I'll take a lie detector. I'll do whatever it takes. You know what I'm saying? If you love Kathy enough to cover up a murder for her, why threaten her? <sighs> it's pathetic, right? I'm in love with her and... And she just laughs at me, man. But, but, but what can I do? Last night she calls me, right? And she says she needs me. I go in the room. And, oh my god, all that blood. And Kat's standing there, right? And it, she's just a mess. Completely helpless. And I get to be her Superman. I mean, who wouldn't want that job, right? I could save her. I, I say I'll, I'll clean up. I'll, I'll clean it all up. I'll pretend I never saw her, and, and I'll make it kind of look like the Mexican did it, you know? So she says, what would I do without you? You see, the deal was, we'd cover for each other, okay? But, but I always knew. I knew she wouldn't keep her word. In the back of my mind, I knew. You know what I'm saying? That's why I called her. That's why I showed up at her place. I knew. I knew she'd never keep her word. I, I, was, I was just hoping. Oh, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, I took it, and, and I tried to use it. D damn. I needed to get high to try to forget the whole thing, you know? I don't know. I don't know. I know that this Lynn chick... I, I guess when she came to town, I didn't see Cat for a while. 
then like out of nowhere, man, I, I, I see Kat with this chick and this Mexican dude at the hotel and it's, you know, it's like the normal routine. And she says, hey, Charlie, give him the special. Kathy said you were pretty proficient with that hunk of glass. I never touched it. Never. I, uh, not last night and not the whole time I've worked there. Cat, mm, she was the one that used the ashtray. I'll bring her in. Yeah, really? Well, that's what I told you. He killed her and then he covered it up. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to charge him with Lynn's murder. Why? Why are you doing this to me? You have no proof. I never touched that ashtray. Because your fingerprint is on the murder weapon, Kathy, you killed Lynn. I just wish we could go back. Two years ago, Lynn and I were together. I loved her so much, and I know it wasn't easy for her to be open about us, but I could never understand why she left me for that idiot. I mean, she even married the guy, and then he ships off to the Middle East for forever, and she can't take it anymore, so she comes back here. I was just hoping we could be together again. That's all. Yeah, but it didn't work out that way. No, but she said that's what she wanted. She wanted us to get back together again. And then she changed her mind again. Suddenly, she didn't want to be with me. She wanted to go home. She wanted to wait for her husband to come home. She said she wasn't being fair to him. Wasn't being fair to him. What about me? You wanted to pick things up where you left off. Living together, working together. Is that why you two took Iron Dominguez to the fantasy suites? Yeah, I convinced her to come out. I even got her the wedding dress. It was stupid, but that dress was real, you know? I wanted her to wear it when we got married. So you two dance for Dominguez and then he runs out of money, right? Yeah, and when I tried to kick his ass out, he got pissed and tried to take Lynn. I tried to stop him. The guy was short but strong. He threw me across the room. I got up and I hit him with the ashtray. It shattered all over the place, but I knocked him out. You saved her. She looked so fragile, so helpless, lying there on the bed. I told her I would always protect her. I would always take care of her and... And I reached out to her to take her into my arms. She pushed me away. She pushed me away. And I don't know why, but I... I couldn't take it. I, I just couldn't. She was so cold. How could she? She broke my heart. She broke my heart. Do you know what that's like? Yes. Yes, I do. It's like mourning someone <laughs> who died. Oh, Lynn, why? DA is filing a second degree murder charge against Kathy Bird. Charles Steer is going to be charged with accessory after the fact. Good job on this one. I gotta say, this one really belongs to you. Great work. We're lucky to have you on the team. I see it's your turn to supervise the new CSI. I don't know how much supervising I'll be doing. That resume read like a who's who of crime scene investigation. Okay, so the old dog might learn some new tricks. You were speaking for yourself, obviously. Who's our Vic? Rick Shimano, referee for the Supreme Force Fighting League. He worked the marquee match last night. I see the banners, and I see blood. I gotta say, it's tough being a ref these days. I mean, all that money and all that ego in sports, takes just one bad call and you're down for the count while there was no rumble in the jungle 
I'm told this fight was the championship match between Hank Hackett and Tito Tiger Valone. According to the program, the two guys are Japanese trained fighters who put on a real show. They whip out their swords to rally the crowd, and I do not mean that figuratively. They really use swords. Last night was the first time that these guys faced off in the ring to determine who was the King Blade of Supreme Force fighting. So who won? Let's just say it wasn't Hackett. Apparently, our dead referee made a controversial call that stripped Hackett of his belt and the Intercontinental title. Where is Hackett now? He's cooling off in the locker room. You'll probably want to talk to him and the、uh, ring girl over there. She found the body. All right. I think we got it from here. Can't hurt to give the crime scene another good once over. If he were just strangled, there wouldn't be blood pooling under his neck. I've seen a lot of strangulations, but this may be the first death by Mike. I think this hair may belong to our strangler. Hello, we're with the Las Vegas Crime Lab. May we get your name? Yes, I'm Tina Allen's. I found Mr. Shimada, and I called the police. Approximately what time did you find the body? Uh, I'd say a little after 11 o'clock. I'm supposed to close the prop room before the arena shuts down at midnight. I was coming down the stairs over there when I noticed the light over the ring was still on. I came over, and that's when I saw Mr. Shimada lying there like that. My God. It's just so awful. Oh, everybody really liked him, and that's saying a lot for a referee, right? <laughs> I know everybody thought he was very fair, but honestly, no, I didn't know him personally. I'm sorry. I should have, but I wasn't really paying attention. But everybody was pissed. Wow. I mean, he like disqualified Hank Hackett. Just stop the fight cold. Handed the title to Tiger. I think he was probably pretty lucky to get out of that ring alive. Well, I mean, sorry, <laughs> that was a really poor choice of words. I would try the locker room. I know they were having a hell of a time locking up down there since all these reporters were still jammed in around Hank trying to talk to him about the match. Gosh, I bet it's an even bigger zoo now. Upper platform, up there. Like I said, I locked it up a couple of hours ago. I'm sorry, but why do you need props for a fight? Well, it's not just props. It's like these big cards that say, you know, like round one, round two. I'm the one that gets to strut around in the bikini, holding up the signs between rounds, looking totally hot. <laughs> your basic sexy ring girl, right? You must be very good at your job. Sure, but that's just how I got my foot in the door. You know, Supreme Force Fighting plans to start a women's league. I've already started to train. And so by the time they pull all the sponsors together, I'll be ready to roll. I got my eyes on the prize, champion of the world. Sounds pretty cool, right? No, I don't. Sorry. I put away the props up there, but the door locks automatically when I close it. Horace has the only key. Who's Horace? Horace Willingham. He owns the league. I called him and told him to come in right away, so he should be here soon. Sorry, I couldn't be of more help to you. Good luck. I'm guessing the footage from the cameras is stored on that upper platform. Wonder if one of these posters is Hank Hackett. We're gonna need a key to open this.
I'll arrange for Dr. Robbins to have the body picked up. He'll call us when he's completed the autopsy. Hank Hackett, we're from the Las Vegas Crime Lab. You mind if we ask you a few questions? The League finally called 911 because I was robbed. Son of a bitch, Shimada. I'm telling you, he is either totally freaking blind or taking some big money from somebody, you hear me? I do not cheat, and that guy calls a misconduct and disqualifies me? That's crap. So you tell me what you need from me, and I'll help you nail Shimada and whoever else the bastard's in bed with. Actually, Mr. Hackett, we're here to investigate Rick Shimada's murder. Murder? What the hell are you talking about? Wh oh, no way. W wait a wait a second. Am I being punked here? Because this is just too sick, man. Come on. This this isn't real. This, this isn't real, is it? Jeez, I can't believe it. Well, I can't say he didn't have it coming. What? I, I'm just being honest here. Oh, great, great. Now, now you're gonna think that I did. Bad freaking tastic. Yeah, I get it. Innocent until proven guilty. What did you do after the match? I came right back here. What else could I do? I couldn't go home. I got reporters all over the place. They're barking at me. I thought I'd just hang out down here until everything started to chill. Yeah, yeah. Now, look. L let me clear up that particular scenario for you guys, because I know you got the wrong idea. So this is it. I'm into the ring, and I got my katana in my hand, okay? I wave it around, do a little show for the crowd, because, well, hey, that's what I do. Okay, so the fight starts, and I'm taking it to Tito. But, okay, there's this moment where Tito gets me against the corner. So I throw a roundhouse to his balls. Now, no ref has ever once had a problem with that move before, I'm telling you. But suddenly, last night, Shimada decides to call a technical and stops the fight. Well, say I lost my sh... I mean, I was very angry. But come on, I had a reason. The guy stole my belt. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. Hey, I've completed the autopsy. I'll give you the full report next time you happen to be in the morgue. I think I'll let someone else pick up the soap. These are for guests. I don't think we need to inspect them. It's good to see you again. Well, your victim was strangled, but the blood was actually the result of blunt force trauma to the neck and upper torso. Take a look here. This contusion and the partially occluded carotid are indicative of ligature strangulation. However, I suspect your victim was unconscious prior to asphyxiation. Notice these lacerations and bruises. I count six distinct injuries along the victim's neck, shoulders, and upper back causing detachment of the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. There was some additional nerve damage, which I really think would have either put your victim in shock or knocked him out cold. It looks to me as if the perpetrator tried to break your victim's neck and then decided to shift to plan B. The microphone cord. And asphyxiation is your official COD. Lividity suggests two to three hours ago. So that puts TOD at around 11 p.m., and the last fight ended an hour before that. Yeah, I found traces of what looks like a white pasty substance smudged around a few of the blunt force injuries. You might want to take a sample with you. Oh, 
It's certainly quite possible that this pasty substance was transferred from the blunt force object used in the attack. The hair from the microphone cord didn't match Shimada, probably meaning it came from our killer. We should be sure to return it. Weird, huh? Not a combination you find every day. Let's see what the almighty internet has to say about this. Okay, you ever heard of Uchigamori stones? It says here they're a type of slate which can be ground up with sodium bicarbonate to form a paste. And this paste is used in the ancient Japanese ritual of Hidori, the sacred art of polishing a katana. Introducing in this corner our first suspect, Hank Hackett. Hold on a second. Let me get this straight. This ref has what kind of paste on him? Toothpaste? It's a paste made from what are called Uchigamori stones and sodium bicarbonate. And it's used to polish samurai swords in an ancient Japanese ritual. Okay, but according to the coroner's report, Shimada was beaten and strangled. He wasn't stabbed with a samurai sword. No, he wasn't. But I'm thinking, what if the blade on the sword was dull and the perp used it to beat Shimada? It'd practically be the same thing as working him over with a jagged metal pipe. Maybe so, but until I see that katana, it's still not enough to go on. Well, then let's hope it's still at the arena. By the way, Horace Willingham, the league's owner, called a couple of minutes ago. He's waiting for you in his office. Fellas, how's it going? What can I do for you? I never miss a fight if I can help it. About midnight. Got a call from Tina. Tina Allens. She works for me. You talked to her yet? Yeah, she sent us your way, actually. Yeah, well, she called me, said she'd found Rick. I told her to hang tight, I'd get back as soon as I could. And here I am. Well... Let me think on that for a second. I started this league about four years ago. I kind of poached Rick from another league, tell you the truth, and I'd say that wasn't more than six months after we got on our feet around here. Oh, hell no. I was a fighter. Oh yeah, ten years. I was one tough son of a bitch, I kid you not. I'm like that fella Evil Knievel. I must have broken every bone in my body at one time or another. I'd still be doing it, too. Seriously. My former employers had to come to me on bended knee and beg me to retire. Offered me a pretty hefty severance package, truth be told. So, my last fight... Man, what a night. Uh, that was the night of March 12th, 1999. Rick was the referee. Funny, it was my last night and his first. We became fast friends. And so, when I took that money they gave me to quit and then I decided to start this league, well hell, of course I was gonna bring my boy Rick over here with me. Hank and I go back about two years. <laughs> Funny story, actually. 
I offered him a contract the very same night I witnessed the man take down three bouncers in a barroom brawl. Man, that boy can fight. Tough as nails, and no disrespect to anyone else on my roster, but Hank's the very best there is. First rule of Supreme Force fighting, you do not fight outside the ring. Second rule of Supreme Force fighting, you do not fight outside the ring. When I say we train them, what I really mean is we discipline them. Hone and polish their skills, try to instill a sense of honor in them. Excuse me for asking, but why are you asking all these questions about Hank? Is he a suspect or something? Just being thorough. Let me check here. Problem with taking one too many whacks to the head is that you kind of developed this nasty habit of putting stuff somewhere for safekeeping and then spending the next hour trying to remember where you put the damn thing. Okay, good. Here it is. I guess my mind isn't as dull as I thought. Does anyone else have a copy of this key? Uh, no. Just me. Hey, I don't mean to step out of line here or nothing, but I gotta ask a favor of you. Is there any way to keep this thing kinda quiet? I mean, do you think we can keep this out of the press for a little while? It's just that I've lost a couple of things in my life that were pretty dear to me. My first wife, Grace, I lost to cancer. God rest her soul. And then, well, I lost my ability to fight. And now, the thought of losing this league because of all of this, well, it's just a little more than I can truly bear. Mr. Willingham, it's department policy not to discuss ongoing investigations. All right, good. We got an image to maintain. Tina left her lipstick. A minor tragedy for those of us who appreciate artificially colored lips. Nice find. A beautiful copy of Willingham's fingerprint. You are good. It's a two-way street. The lipstick goes on her lips, and her DNA goes on the lipstick. Now we've got Tina's prints for our file. He works. Let's head upstairs. Pretty nice setup here. Looks like it's capable of recording whatever's happening in the fighting ring from one, two, five different angles. That VCR isn't connected to the mixing board. Looks like it's wired directly to the security camera. Video cassette. Remember when I said this is a pretty nice setup? I take it back. This must be the prop closet. Well, there's only one prop we need. just came apart in your hands. I'm gonna guess it didn't do that during the show last night. A 
It looks as though there was a piece of wood that held the blade in. Somehow it broke. I wouldn't worry about cutting yourself. Blade's too dull. Well, what do you know? Initials H. H. Well, it doesn't quite spell it out for us, but I think it's a pretty good bet this sword belongs to Hank Hackett. Unless Hugh Hefner is even better with the sword than we realized. <laughs> See that? It's some kind of oily residue, and it's all over the blade. have blood on the blade of the sword. I wonder whose it is. Tape ran out just when it was getting good. I guess the tape cuts off for every camera when the main recording is stopped. Well, one thing's for sure, Hank lied to us. He did have a few words with Shimada after the fight, a few pretty angry words it looked like. methane. I've actually seen it before. It's an acid-based hydrocarbon, pretty common in metal cleaners. Perfect for removing fingerprints and other trace evidence from a metal surface. Got it. Blood on the sword is a match to Rick Shimada. Probably broke during the attack, then the killer used the microphone cord to finish the job. What do you need? I'll see what I can do. Show me the evidence. Proverbial smoking katana. Shimada's blood on Hackett's sword is certainly enough to bring him in for questioning. Hank, can you explain to us why we found Shimada's blood on your katana? What? Now that's not possible! I'm telling you, Tina locked that thing up in the prop closet right after the fight. I know that room was locked when I left and I don't have the key! What aren't you telling us? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I had a lot of things I wanted to say to that bastard, but I didn't get the chance. 
I never saw him after the fight. Hank, we have video of you arguing with Shimada in the ring after the fight. Okay, okay. <laughs> Look, I can explain this. Well, that's good. Because right now, I think you're full of crap. I had to set the record straight with him, okay? My, my whole damn reputation was at stake here. I didn't cheat! Now, after he DQ'd me, I went back to the locker room just like I told you before. I had to cool down. Otherwise, I might have killed the guy. But! I didn't do anything to him. You get that straight through your head right this second, okay? What I did was... I went back into the arena, and he was still there, okay? And I, I, I just tried to explain to him, as calm as I could, exactly what I had done, and what I sincerely believed that he had totally screwed the pooch on that call. You didn't seem too calm in the video. Look, Shimada's the one who decides to get back into the ring and show me what I had really done. And I told him he was just plain totally blind, because what he was showing me wasn't what I had done. Nah, no, not at all. Then, you know, I, I, I may have said something or other about his mother, and whether or not she could be fully trusted to know the true identity of his father. And then I might have shoved him. It doesn't matter, because I realized he wasn't going to change his mind, so I left. I didn't kill him. I swear it. I still think you're hiding something. Damn it! This ain't right! It ain't! I, I'm a good fighter! I don't deserve this! The only way we can help you, Hank, is if you talk to us. You have to talk to us. <sighs> It's all a fix, all right? The, the, the whole thing, every single one of my fights, just like wrestling. Horace would pay the refs to make sure I came out on top. That's why I was so surprised when Shimada kicked me out tonight. Oh, I really should have seen it coming, though. Yeah. Shimada was old school, you know? And, and this was his first fight with me. He wasn't about to take a bribe, not even from Horace and his buddies. So if Shimada exposed the truth, that would be the end of your career, right? You weren't gonna let that happen. Look, did I want to end the guy? You bet your ass I did. But for the first time in my life, I decided to take Horace's advice to me. And I walked away, okay? I figured Shimada was gonna do whatever he was gonna do. It was out of my hands. I went back to my locker, made a call to a buddy of mine doing time in Maui. You don't believe me? You're welcome to check my damn cell phone. If the call was made to a correctional facility, I should be able to get a tape of the conversation. But you still could have called him from the arena. Yeah, no way, man. You can never get a signal in that damn arena. Check it out for yourself. All right, Mr. Hackett, wait here. It should be a simple matter to check the phone reception in the arena, and if your story checks out, you'll be in good shape. Well, get ready to come crawling back, because I'm innocent. Heck, it was right. There isn't any reception in here at all. Let's check in with Brass, see if he has those phone records. Yeah? Yeah, the prison emailed me their recording of the call. I gave it a listen, and it was definitely Hackett on the phone. Wouldn't shut up, actually. Well, we checked the phone reception at the arena, and there's no way he could have made that call from the ring. I guess that means we're gonna have to let Hank go. Would you care to do the honors? That's it? That's it. For the moment. What do you mean, for the moment? Y you said if I told you the truth, you'd help me out. What, what the hell does for the moment mean, huh? Settle down, Mr. Hackett. Don't you dare treat me like I'm a child, you hear me? Hey, and don't you dare eyeball me like that! I will not hesitate! Mr. Hackett, I strongly suggest that you choose your next few words very carefully. Whether or not you walk out that door a free man depends on it. That didn't go well. Back to square one, I guess. The thing that's still bugging me is that hair from the crime scene. If we can match that hair, I think we'll have found our killer. Maybe someone would be willing to give up their DNA for a test. You never know.
No match. That's not Tina's hair on the microphone cord. Hey guys, did you hear we had to let our primary suspect walk? Hackett? Didn't his katana have the victim's blood on it? It did, but he couldn't have been in the ring at the time of the murder. Did someone else have access to the katana? The ring girl locked the katana in the prop room after the fight, but her DNA didn't match the hair found on the murder weapon. Who has the key to the prop room? Apparently, the league owner has the only one, and according to Hackett, he was fixing fights, but our dead ref wasn't cooperating. If the referee was killed to keep him quiet, then we better warn Hackett. He could be in danger as well. Too late now. Hank Hackett is dead. Were there any witnesses? None. Dispatch received an anonymous tip. Looks like steroids. Can't say I'm surprised the way he stormed out of the interrogation room. Might be a suicide, might not. If not, then someone's committing murders faster than we can solve them. Better get moving, then. Weird how that syringe is just hanging there like that. Something tells me that's not vitamin B12. No prints there. Prints probably Hackett's, but we'll put it in Aphis and see if we get lucky. I'll arrange for Dr. Robbins to have the body picked up. I can't say for sure, but what I can say is this. You see how pale the skin surrounding the needle is? His heart had already stopped pumping blood. This syringe was injected post-mortem. However, I did find a couple of wounds which suggest earlier injections. Cardiac arrest, brought on by a toxic exposure to dimethoxymethane, probably injected. I've only run a preliminary tox screen, but I'm sure the full tox panel will bear out the results. Killed by dimethoxymethane? That's the same stuff used to wipe down his katana. There's got to be a connection. Nope, I've found no defensive wounds. I placed the syringe on the tray there, if you'd like to take a closer look. I placed the syringe on the tray there, if you'd like to take a closer look. We're racking up murder weapons at an alarming rate. Another hair. Could be a strange coincidence, or we could have a killer who's shedding. Seventeen hydroxyprogesterone. Looks like our man Hackett was on the juice. Dimethoxymethane. That's the metal cleaner that was found in Hackett's system, all right.
No dice. That's not Tina's hair on the syringe. So Willingham had his hands on Hackett's vials. Oh, Horace, how could you? Hey. Show me what you got. Willingham may be giving his fighters a little too much help. We need to learn more about his operation. Okay, you got it, but remember, this is not a fishing expedition. The search warrant's very specific. You're looking for items that will directly link Willingham to one or both of the murders. Fellas, how's it going? What can I do for you? We have a warrant to search these premises. A warrant? Is that right? Jeez, it's really coming down to this now, isn't it? Mr. Willingham, your fingerprints were found on a vial of steroids at the scene of Hank Hackett's murder. You'll excuse me while I go talk to my lawyer. You have to knock out a whole lot of guys to get this many trophies. A leather desk. Classy. Wow, I'd say there's about $5,000 here, with a note that reads, Thanks, but no thanks, initials RS. Oh, looks like Rick Shimada might have wanted to refuse a gratuity. Nothing out of the ordinary here. Hey, I've seen some of these fights. What's in this exactly? I'm not sure, but hey, that's why they invented the lab. We haven't met yet. I'm Riley Adams. I know I'm making a heck of a first impression here, but I'm stumped. I have the strangest chemical sample, a spot of brown sludge from the floor of our crime scene. I can't figure out what it is. Maybe you can take a look. Crude oil, seawater, seagull guano, and chewing tobacco. Nick did say one of our suspects had been a longshoreman. Thanks, you've been a huge help. Oh, and nice to meet you. very same metal cleaner that was used earlier. This is not gonna look good on Willingham's permanent record. The very same metal cleaner that was used earlier. This is not gonna look good on Willingham's permanent record. What do you need? 
Do you have enough evidence? All right, let's see what Mr. Willingham has to say for himself now. Well, Horace, care to explain why you have the same metal cleaner used you to kill... You know what? Save your breath. I'm ready to talk. So here it is. After the fight, I overheard Hank arguing with Rick. And then Rick said he'd go to the press, tell everybody about how it was all a fake, how it was all one big rip-off. Truth was, I was juicing that night too. <laughs> you believe it? Old habits dying hard and all that? Suppose it was the roid rage that got the better of me. After Hank left, I grabbed that sword and snuck down into the ring. I didn't cut him. I just beat him to hell with it. But the stupid thing broke in two, so I grabbed the microphone cord and strangled him with it. And then Hank gets blamed for the whole thing. <laughs> I knew he couldn't keep his damn mouth shut, so I did what I had to do. I tell you, it was pretty easy, too. Hank hated needles, so I was the one who usually gave him his medicine. I filled his syringe with that metal cleaner and then gave Hank his last injection. I deeply believe I have a moral obligation to fulfill here. A moral obligation to the truth. And to certain people, the League, I don't want to hurt them any longer. It was me, and me alone. I take full responsibility. I, Horace Willingham, killed them both. Alright, Brass got us Williams' DNA when he confessed, so let's take a look here. I knew it! Williams' DNA doesn't match the hair at the crime scene. I had a feeling that confession was too easy. There must be someone else involved. I'll tell Brass not to take Willingham away just yet. His briefcase was already checked in as evidence, so take a look inside and see if you can find anything. It's a match. The same person was involved in both crimes. Only question is, which person? Hey. Okay, meet me in interrogation. You got me. I already confessed to double homicide. That not enough for you? Look, why are you harassing me? I did it. I said I did it. What do you want from me? Did you confess to protect someone? I'm looking at life in prison or worse. You honestly think I'm that nice? Okay. Hey, check this out. Supreme Force Fighting's request for a $50,000 loan to expand into a women's league was just turned down. Oh, and look at the co-signer on the loan, Tina Allens. Funny, she never mentioned she was a part owner. It's a bet for $10,000 on Hackett to lose last night's fight. He was a heavy favorite, so this slip is worth 50 grand. Except the bet wasn't made by Willingham. It was made by Tina Allens. Now why would she trust him with this? 
And how'd she know Hackett would lose? Yeah? William already confessed. You guys find something new? Tina, Tina, Tina. You can't bet on fighters in your own league. This is enough to bring her in, but we still have to find out if she's involved with the killings. Ms. Allens, as you may know, Horace Willingham confessed to the murders of Rick Shimada and Hank Hackett. But we have reason to believe that you may know more about this than you're letting on. I know exactly as much as I'm letting on. Namely, nothing at all. If he confessed, then he must have done it. What? I look good in a bikini so I can't possibly own a business? I know just as much about the League as anyone, if not more. Why shouldn't I be a co-owner? That's right. About time, too. A woman can do anything a man can do. Anything? Look, this is Vegas. If you call someone in for questioning every time they make a bet, then I can understand why we've got so many unsolved murders in this city. Alright, and what were you planning to do with your winnings? Start that women's league? What if I was? Sure, I put the props away every night, but no one ever got murdered before. Besides, by the time Shimada was killed, the prop closet was locked and I had no way to get in there. He did. I hate to see Horace go to prison, but this mess is his own fault. No, I never came near Shimada or Hackett. Everybody's gotta lose someday. Hackett sure lost today, all right. Look, there's a reason they call it gambling. I just made a lucky guess. I picked up Miss Allen's personal effects when we booked her. kind of prescription medication. No label, but it does have an ID number. We could look this up in the medical database, but we'd need a warrant to access her medical records first. I wonder what this could be a key for. our keys to the same lock. Unfortunately, her medical history is private and we don't have a warrant. We'll have to convince Brass it's relevant. What do you need? I still haven't seen any evidence that Tina could have committed either murder. Have you found something implicating her? So she did have access to the katana. I buy that she could have done it. Nevertheless, the question remains, what in her medical history has any bearing on this case?
Ja. What in her medical history has any bearing on this case? Unless we know what that's used for, there's no reason to think it's relevant to this case. Penicillin, an immunosuppressant. Why would she need that? Well, we could always ask her. That's, uh, that's just something I take for my acne. What do you care? Acne, huh? I don't think penicillin is used for that. Lucky for us, we've got a doctor in the morgue who can tell us whether you're lying. Prednisolone? No, that would be a very bad idea. Whoever told you that is either very misinformed themselves or willfully misinforming you. I think Brass will want to hear this. He loves it when people willfully misinform. Always a pleasure. Let me know how it all turns out. Hey! What in her medical history has any bearing on this case? She was lying about this. What else is she lying about? Go ahead and look up those medical records. Let's see here. Apparently, Tina had an artificially high androgen level, which caused severe premature hair loss. The prednisolone was prescribed as an immunosuppressant for an experimental hair transplant procedure. But get this, they couldn't find a suitable spot on her scalp to get the hair follicles, so they transplanted follicles from another person entirely. Which means the DNA in her hair doesn't match the rest of her DNA. We've been comparing the hair at the crime scene to the wrong DNA all along. I already gave you a DNA sample. Yes, but it's not your DNA we want. Finally, it was Tina all along. Let's give her the good news. Finally, it was Tina all along. Let's give her the good news.
Yeah. Okay, meet me in interrogation. Our relationship is none of your concern. You leave Tina out of this. Okay. I try not to limit myself. I'll bring her in. I just made a lucky guess. If there was any fight fixing going on, I certainly never heard about it. I have no idea what Horace was up to. No, I never came near Shimada or Hackett. This doesn't make sense. We've collected more evidence than just that. He did. I hate to see Horace go to prison, but this mess was his own fault. No, I never came near Shimada or Hackett. You were at the scene of both crimes. William copped to it. But it was you who overheard Shimada say he was going to the press. You who grabbed the katana and attacked him with it. And you who strangled him with the microphone cord when the katana broke. And then it was you who injected Hackett with a toxic chemical to keep him quiet. All because you wanted that woman's league no matter what the cost. Of course we have Willingham's confession. He'll probably just get life in prison. But then again, he might get his own lethal injection. He did all that for you. You're not just business partners. He must really love you. Are you gonna let him fall on his sword like that? You were pulling the strings the whole time, weren't you? I bet you even coached Willingham on his confession. Are you really that good? It was me and me alone. I take full responsibility. I, Tina Allens, killed them both. Hey, great working with you on this case. Can you believe it? Two murders, two confessions, one killer. I could say they'll get easier, but I'd be lying. Good job, you two. Case closed with minimal overtime. Just the way the taxpayers like it. Now go home and get some rest. You've earned it. Do we have an ID on the victim? Seriously? You don't recognize her? Clarinda Jackson? Post of Rumors. It was on for years. Rumors? Well, rumors is one of those shows where married couples go on and make money by airing their dirty laundry. Anyway, she's been working in the showroom of the Silver Skies Casino, hosting a stage version of Rumors. I don't see any security cameras. Well, turns out Twilight Palms believes surveillance cameras compromise its commitment to celebrity rehab. It's an outpatient facility with a wide-open door policy. The fact that there's nothing around for miles probably makes it easy enough to monitor the patient's comings and goings. Well, we're checking with the other patients, seeing if anyone saw or heard anything. One name keeps popping up. Steve Tampson, another patient here. By all accounts, he and Clorinda were close. I also called her husband. He's on his way, but he lives more than an hour away. I'll let you know when he gets here. It's a shame. I'm sure this woman hit a bottom. She came here hoping to change her life. And ran into something else she was powerless against. Hey, good to see you. You haven't missed anything. I can start on the scene if you'd like to take the witness. Yes, apparently that was a very popular television program. Brass told me she's now hosting a live version in the showroom at the Silver Skies. From what I've seen so far, particularly the fact that the victim is wearing her bathing suit, it just doesn't feel as though we're looking at a suicide. Could very well be an accident, but... But I'm getting ahead of the evidence again, aren't I? 
Let's start processing. So much for a therapeutic soak. That ring has a tribal pattern. They're popular for tattoos. This is interesting. I haven't seen any plants around here with foliage like this. It looks familiar. This is a Deranger cap. Deranger. A colleague of mine used to live on this stuff. It's citrus soda with a French flair, he said. I never tried it, but he swore by it. It's a broken Deranger bottle. I'm actually a little surprised this print survived the humidity near the hot tub. <laughs> Smells like alcohol. Yes, I am. What is this uh, in regards to? I understand. I, I heard there was an accident in the, in the spa. We're still investigating the circumstances of Ms. Jackson's death. We'll find out if it was an accident soon enough. Clarinda? I, well, we've been going through this rehab thing together, you know? We're, we were friends. Man, sorry for the shakes. It's just hard thinking she's dead. No way. I mean, she wasn't thrilled with her marriage, but she was here to turn things around. She was on her way up, not down. Hey, that's tight. No, I've, I've, I've never seen it before. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, I will. Hey, the victim's husband just showed up. I'm done taking a statement, but I'm sure you'll have some questions of your own. We should arrange for Ms. Jackson's body to be taken to the morgue. I'll call Dr. Robbins. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest, Clarinda Jackson. And there's one more for the scrapbook. I'm sorry, you have a scrapbook? Of all your autopsies? No, just the celebrity ones. The warm spa water may have complicated lividity, but between that and vitreous potassium levels, I'd estimate her time of death to be somewhere between 10 and 11 p.m. Did you find water in her lungs? Yeah, the chlorinated spa water saturated her lungs, suggesting that the cause of death to be asphyxiation due to drowning. However, I also found post-mortem bruising along her shoulders. Take a look. I'd say they appear to be handprints. My professional opinion? Someone held Ms. Jackson under the water until she drowned. Of 
course. Would I leave you with nothing fun to do? Please enjoy. I haven't had a chance yet to send the samples over, but I did run a prelim tox. Victim's blood alcohol level was 0 0.08 and there are traces of flunitrazepam metabolite. Flunitrazepam has been illegal in the U.S. for years. Its association with date rape is by no means accidental. I would be surprised if Miss Jackson knew it was there. There is, actually. I recovered some semen from Miss Jackson's vaginal vault. The sex appears to have been consensual. I collected a sample for you. Take a look at the left hand print, the deeper bruising around what would be the base of the ring finger. Our killer may have been wearing a wedding ring. I want to get a shot of that. imperfections along the edges of all the decoration on this ring. Perhaps it was handmade. Clorinda's killer was wearing the ring we found. Carbonated water, high fructose corn syrup, citric acid, sodium benzoate, food starch, caffeine, glycerol ester, ascorbic acid, yellow 6, red 40, ethanol, and flunitrazepam, orange soda, vodka, and a roofie. looking on our celebrity murder. I'd love to have something to tell under Sheriff Eckley. There has been a bit of a development. Miss Jackson had sex with someone other than her husband the night of the murder. Tox screen showed signs of flunitrazepam in her system, so it may not have been consensual. With whom? Do we know? Another patient at the rehab clinic, a Mr. Stephen Tamson. Codis hit? He gave his DNA voluntarily. His cousin was reported missing three years ago and Stephen was next of kin. It turned out to be a false alarm, but the information is still in the system. No good deed goes unpunished, I guess. See if Brass can bring him in on suspicion of rape. All right. There's also some physical evidence, a ring, but we're still looking at where that fits. Finding the person it fits might be a good start. I'll be ready to go in just a moment. You might want to take a look at this before we leave. I've identified the leaf fragment from the crime scene. 
It's actually an entire young plant, Kalankohi degramontiana, also known as Devil's Backbone or my personal favorite, Mother of Thousands. It's a species native to Madagascar, fairly prolific. They're able to reproduce asexually by forming young plants like the one we found along the edges of their leaves. What do you need? I'll see what I can do. Show me the evidence. Even if she hadn't been murdered, date rape is still rape. Not only did you have intercourse with the victim, but she had roofies in her system when she was murdered. Wait, murder? Roofies? What the hell? I don't know anything about that. Not when you ask like that. Look, yeah, we had sex pretty much every day this week, but she was a married woman. It's not the kind of thing you just blurt out. Yeah, I keep detailed records every time I get laid. How the hell would... Wait, yeah, maybe. We both got STD tests on the same day. I can give you my medical record number or whatever. You guys can look stuff like that up, right? I don't know what Clorinda's was. <laughs> Dr. Robbins, our coroner, can provide Clorinda's medical records to us. Write your number down and we'll look it up on the medical database. No problem. <laughs> I wish. Would you try it on for us? On your left ring finger, please. Like a wedding ring, huh? Sure, I'll try it on. <laughs> it's a little big for me. I've always had skinny fingers. Look, it's a nice ring, but it ain't mine. Stephen did get tested for sexually transmitted diseases, just as he said. That's quite a laundry list of tests. He wasn't taking any chances. She was tested for a wide range of STDs last week. She went the whole nine yards. HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HPV, even syphilis. The results were all negative. It appears Stephen was telling the truth. I find it unlikely that they would both have such comprehensive screening done at the same place and time, coincidentally. You're free to go, but we'd like to ask you some more questions. Hey, sure. Somebody murdered my girlfriend. I want to help. I don't remember her saying anything, but she used the spa quite a bit. No, I was in my room, chilling out. Clorinda and I had just, you know, I was resting. Like somebody that would kill her? No, she never mentioned anything like that. She did gripe about this guy from work, though. Jack Shell, I think his name was. I don't know all the details, but I guess he and Clorinda had this rivalry going. And her marriage was pretty messed up, obviously. Probably. She left him a message last night. Oh, God, you don't think... That crazy bastard! Mr. Tamsin, I understand your feelings, but take it from me. It does not pay to get ahead of the evidence. We'll find Clorinda's killer. Rest assured. Can you think of anything that might help us find Clorinda's killer? I don't know what else to say. I don't think I really had a chance to know everything about her life yet. I believe you're free to go. Hey, thanks. If you need me, I'll be back at the rehab center. If I ever needed to be surrounded by shrinks, it's now. Hey, I got Ernie Goldwasser down here. He wants to know the results of his wife's autopsy. I can stall him for a while, but if you want to be the one who tells him his wife was murdered, 
Then you need to get over to my office right away. Yeah? We got him down in interrogation. He walked off with his wife's purse, so we're holding him for interfering with a crime scene. That sounds like an honest mistake from a grieving husband to me. Me too. Honestly. But it is what it is. Let's go talk to him. Look, you want to tell me why Captain Brass is accusing me of removing evidence from a crime scene when all I did was take my wife's personal belongings from Twilight Palms and bring them back home with me? Mr. Goldwasser, your wife's been the victim of a homicide. Homicide? Do you know who killed her? No. Is that the man who killed my wife? Mr. Goldwasser, I need to ask you to calm down. I know how difficult this must be for you, but we're doing the best we can to conduct a full and thorough investigation of your wife's death. I have no idea who you're talking about. None whatsoever, but if he had something to do with her death, I swear to God. Look, please take my wife's personal items. You'll need them. They're evidence, right? Take whatever you need. Do whatever you have to do. I don't think so. No, I don't recognize that ring. You hesitated a moment. I thought for a moment that it looked familiar, but I, I, I don't know why. Maybe I've seen it before. I, I honestly don't know. Would you mind trying the ring on your left ring finger? <sighs> I'd rather not remove my own wedding ring if at all possible. Please. Mr. Goldwasser, it will only take a moment and it will help our investigation. All right, all right. Give it here. Yeah, it's a bit small. Can't get it over my knuckle. Sorry. That's definitely not my ring. In the last few days before Ms. Jackson's death, Mr. Goldwasser called her cell phone several times. Well, no surprise there. His last call was made at 10 p.m. on the day of the murder, which is around the approximate time of death. Wait a moment, there's some kind of trace evidence on that phone. This phone is conspicuously free of fingerprints. I wonder if that thread came from something used to wipe it down. That call was made at 10 p.m., but the last call on the phone was to check voicemail at 10.15. I know I've heard that bell somewhere before. Affair? How dare you say that to me? We know it isn't an easy thing to discuss, Mr. Goldwasser, but please, tell us what you know. Oh, God, this is all such a shock to me. I had no idea she was seeing anyone else. Cheating bitch. I'll kill you and the little coward you're screwing. I... Uh, I see. I... Uh, yeah, that sounded really bad, even to me. But you have to understand, she, she just left me a message telling me that she was sleeping with someone. I would never have actually done anything. So when they found her dead in the hot tub a couple of hours later, that was just a big coincidence? Yes, damn it! I was at home. I got home from work at about 9.45 and I heard Clorinda's message. I had to calm down a little bit before I called her, so... You left that message after calming down. Yeah, I thought I had myself under control, but I heard her voice on the voicemail and I flipped out all over again. That was right at 10. 
I remember because the whole time I was talking, the stupid bell from the church up the hill was ringing. Now I know why that bell sounded so familiar. I remember that church. But when I first came out here to teach my seminar, a colleague from the university was showing me around. He's a history professor, and he told me that the church was built in the middle of nowhere specifically to allow for the ringing of that bell at all hours. I can definitely confirm that it's more than an hour away from the Twilight Palms Rehabilitation Center. So he makes a death threat, and it turns out to be his alibi? <laughs> I've been complaining about those bells since we moved in. Never again. Looks like you're off the hook for now. But we're hoping you might stay and answer a few more questions. Like I told you before we got sidetracked, I will do anything I can to help you find whoever killed my wife. Drugs? What are you talking about? Someone put flunitrazepam in her drink. A roofie. Roofie? Somebody spiked her drink? I can think of one son of a bitch who might have wanted her dead. Jack Shell. Jack Shell? The Stars and Bars guy? Doesn't he have a show at the Silver Skies, too? He sure does, the no-talent bastard. Not only that, but we recently found out that the casino was going to cut one of its shows, either Jack's or Clorinda's. I can send you a copy of the email from my phone. Oh, you can bet that Jack wanted to keep his job, so he made damn sure Clorinda wouldn't show up to work today. We're from the Las Vegas Crime Lab. Are you Jack Shell? Why, by my stars and bars, indeed I am. What can I do for you? I'm always willing and able to assist our men and women in law enforcement. We're investigating the death of Clorinda Jackson. We understand you both had shows at the Silver Skies Casino. Hold on. Did you just say that Clorinda died? She's dead? Oh, my dear Lord, how on earth? What happened? We're not quite sure yet. But you folks wouldn't be here talking to me if you didn't think she'd been murdered. This is just the most awful thing I've ever heard in my whole life. Clarinda, she was a dear, dear sweet friend. And just a magnificent talent. We shall not see another like her again in this business, I'll tell you that. She will be profoundly missed. You considered Miss Jackson a close personal friend, but might there have been a certain amount of professional rivalry? Uh, no. Well, if anything, I'd call it sibling rivalry, pure and simple. We'd both grown up together in show business. <laughs> Had our share of ups and downs, let me tell you what. And then, by chance, we found ourselves here in Sin City, both with shows at the Silver Skies. Her show'd come in right after mine in the, you know, main showroom. You see, I play the lounge. But anyway, we still share some crew and some staff, and even some audience, I'd say. There was a certain amount of competitiveness, sure, but why would you ask a leading question like that? Did someone say something? Mr. Shell. Now, nah, please, call me Jack. My friends all call me Jack. Now, did someone say I had it out for Clorinda or something? Because that most assuredly was not the case. And I definitely have to say that person is lying to you. Mr. Shell. Jack. Jack, I'm afraid we're going to need you to establish your alibi during the time Clorinda was murdered. And to tell you the truth, I'm not really sure how I'd be able to verify this for you, but I'd be willing to swear on a stack of Bibles that I was at my home last night by myself, fast asleep. Do you often go to bed so early? I tell you, I learned the very hardest way that you will not enjoy longevity in this business if you insist on burning your candle at both ends. So, <laughs> I just tossed that some bitch candle as far away from me as I could. I cannot tell you the number of lives that could be saved each year if they just heed my living example. I'm sure that's true, Jack. Look, uh, be straight with me. You don't honestly believe that I had something to do with killing Clarinda, now do you? Did you ever see Clorinda have words with anyone? A disgruntled employee, perhaps? Maybe a problem with management? No. Now, I, look, you can't have me speaking out of school now, can you? I mean, it don't feel right to talk about rumors and innuendos and such. But 
Well, I don't think it was really very much of a secret that she and Ernest, that's her husband, they weren't getting along too well. And, you know, surprise, surprise, I mean, Clorinda's the fourth Mrs. Ernest Goldwasser, so I'm pretty sure Ernest's not too good at communicating with the wife. I could not honestly tell you whether or not I have seen that or any other particular piece of jewelry before. It's just not the sort of thing I concern myself with when it comes to making a person's acquaintance. We have an internal email from the casino stating that either your show or Clorinda Jackson's would be cancelled. Were you aware of it? Sadly, I was all too aware of it, yes. But it ain't called show friends, now is it? This is a business and apparently, according to the accounts here, the entertainment wing of the operation wasn't flapping too strong. Of course, I disagreed with their evaluation. I see myself affecting people in ways that cannot be measured in cold, hard cash. But, in the end, wasn't my call to make. Jack, you ever pay Clorinda a visit after hours? Perhaps between 10 and 11 p.m. last night? Now, it's my nature to offer myself completely to those who protect and serve our community, but I truly cannot accept the tone of your question. There is an insinuation in it that I simply will not tolerate. Now, if you please, my dressing room is my very special place. It's sacred to me. Now, I take to the stage momentarily, and I need to focus myself sharply, so if you please, we must continue this discussion at some further point. I wish you a very pleasant day. I believe I made it abundantly clear that I no longer wish to be disturbed by your baseless and spurious allegations. Now, once again, I have a show to perform, and you two are interfering with my composure. Please, be on your way. You think of what I'm thinking? The prints are in plain view. Don't need a warrant. have a match to Jack Shell. I think his great American routine is about to wear thin. Hey. I'm gonna need to see some evidence before I go to a judge. Put that print at the crime scene together with the casino's internal memo, and I have a pretty good feeling we're gonna get a judge's signature on that search warrant. Jack, we have a search warrant to examine your dressing room. How dare you, sir? Have y'all lost your damn minds? Jack, simmer down, okay? We have your fingerprint on a bottle of Duranger, which was left behind at the scene of Miss Jackson's murder. There have got to be at least 20 bottles of that stuff in the break room fridge. I must have touched that one before Clarinda took it. That's all that is. It means nothing. Nevertheless, we have a warrant, so please, let us in. I have never been so humiliated in all my life. Seems Ms. Jackson didn't so much turn over a new leaf as have it raked. Ah, the mother of thousands. If the young plant we found at the crime scene was spawned from this one, it would have been recently. We should be able to match them up at the lab. 
we need to be able to match the missing sprout to the empty spot from which it originated. I understand. I would want the same thing in your shoes. It's really day shift's case, but I'll see if I can get someone. How about those two? They seem to have enough time to stand around and watch us talk. Maybe we can put them to work. Actually, ma'am, we... Lieutenant Briggs. At least until I get this case wrapped up. Then I can get on with my retirement. I'll leave you to it. Good luck. I may need it. Now here's the situation. Some maniac dropped a bowling ball out of a second-story window and killed the kid tagging the building below. Day Shift got a piece of skin from the thumb hole on the ball, but they weren't able to work up a sample from it. Now, I don't need DNA to tell me who did this, but the courts do, so I need you to isolate the sample for me. Lieutenant, we'll certainly do our best. Excellent job. Let's hope this brings Lieutenant Briggs one step closer to retirement. And so we reunite the mother of thousands with one of her children, which isn't good news for Mr. Shell. Yeah? Do you have enough evidence? Okay, you got the warrant. Jack, we found traces of the plant from your dressing room at the crime scene. We know you were there. That's quite an extraordinary claim, considering it isn't the least bit true. I don't even know where Clarinda lives. Oh, that poor dear. I wasn't aware she had a problem, no. You had a confidential memo that specifically mentions Clorinda's alcohol problem. You lie to us, Jack. You gave Clorinda that bottle because you needed her out of the way. Well, you just know it all, don't you? I suppose there's no point in continuing this ruse. Yes, I knew about Clarinda's proclivities, and yes, I did pay her a social call last night. I just wanted to give her enough rope to... Let me choose my words carefully here. I just wanted to provide her with the opportunity to drink her way right out of rehabilitation, thus ensuring my continued employment. But you listen to me. I couldn't possibly kill a woman. So, you draw the line at getting an alcoholic drunk and ruining her career. Your point is well taken, sir. It was not what I would call my shining moment, but believe it or not, I do have the self-awareness to realize that if I lose my little second-rate show at that little second-rate casino, my career is over. 
I would never even consider killing somebody, but there can come a point when your future is on the line that you stop worrying about what will keep you proud and focus on what's going to keep you fed. I must admit I would not be in the deplorable situation in which I currently find myself had I, as you say, taken the time to wipe that bottle down. But the truth is, I didn't have the time. Right as I was about to leave Clorinda to her hot tub and the booze fest that I could only guess was about to ensue, some fool walked in on us. Yes, a champion dullard casually strolled in only to sneeze all over my lucky sweater. Well, I had to take it off as soon as I returned to my dressing room. Couldn't put it anywhere but back at the end of the rack because goodness knows when the dry cleaning... Jack, stay focused. Did this gentleman sneeze on you before or after you slipped Clorinda the Mickey? Slip her a Mickey? What on earth are you... Oh, dear. I just realized something. There is something I haven't told you. Getting her drunk wasn't my idea. It was Ernest Goldwasser's. I'm having trouble understanding what Mr. Goldwasser would stand to gain from getting his wife fired. I asked that sneaky son of a gun about the very same thing when he came to me with his plan. He explained it like this. Ernest was done with showbiz. And even more done with Clarinda in showbiz. He wanted her to settle down, start squeezing out some pups, which at her age would have been ambitious at best. But as far as she was concerned, she was gonna die up there on that stage. Whether it was singing or spinning a roulette wheel or asking folks how many times a night they make whoopee or whatever. So he came to me with a bottle of her favorite cocktail with that damn memo about Clarinda's contract. He said there was no way she would take a drink in front of him, but that she would never back down from anything she saw as a challenge from me. That last part I knew from experience to be true. But now, having been informed of this unfortunate business of her drink being spiked, I think it's altogether clear what happened. That no good backstabber set me up. Mr. Goldwasser, according to Jack Shell, you wanted to sabotage your wife's career and sobriety so that she would come home and make babies for you. Why, you... You have got some nerve, you condescending piece of trash! You have no idea how much I love my wife! You have no idea! Hey, Ernie, we got a pretty good idea how you set up Jack Shell to take the fall, so you can just reel in the indignation, okay? Admit it. You killed your wife. I set Jack Shell up? Try the other way around, pal. Why the hell do you think I told you about him in the first place? I gave him a simple job. Give my wife some booze so that she could finally come home and have a life with me. And now she's dead! I don't want to lawyer up, I really don't. But if you don't stop pointing the finger at me and start getting about the business of finding out how Jack killed my wife, I'll have no choice! Mr. Goldwasser, it's not my place to advise you, but if you are truly both innocent and interested in finding your wife's killer, then we are your best hope. I... Damn it. Just keep looking, okay? Please. I have no idea. I didn't touch anything in her purse. This looks exactly like the sweater he has on now. In fact, all of these sweaters look the same. I wonder how he knows which one is the lucky one. Don't worry. A cold virus generally only lives for five or six hours on a contaminated surface. That said, it couldn't hurt to wash up and get a new set of gloves.
think we have a few more questions for bachelor number one. Hey. Show me what you got. Since the DNA from Jack Shell's sweater corroborates his testimony, there shouldn't be any problem getting a warrant to search Tamsin's room for evidence linking him to the murder of Clorinda Jackson. Is there a problem, officer? Mr. Tamsin, this is a warrant to search your room and possessions. If you wouldn't mind stepping outside, please. If I didn't know better, I'd think this was just another ordinary hotel room. Same color as the thread we found on the victim's phone. I agree. We'll want to take a closer look at that. Ah, this is where the hotel room illusion ends. These look like divorce papers from Ernest Goldwasser and Clorinda Jackson. The names are handwritten over what appears to be some sort of correctional fluid. And those dates are over eight years ago. I don't think I'd try to pass these off as real, but I don't think that's the point.
Maybe we'll have better luck with a different magnification. The thread on the phone came from that tower. The light can't get through the correctional fluid. We'll have to figure out some way to remove it. Wait, I have an idea. If we look at it from the back, we should be able to highlight the impressions the typewriter or pen made on the paper. I hope you can read backwards. Steve Tamson covered the names on his own divorce papers with correctional fluid, then wrote Ernest and Clarinda's name on top. Maybe we have a revenge boat. What do you need? You got it. Divorce papers? What, what are you talking about? And you keep bringing up Steve Tampson. Who the hell is this guy? Son of a bitch! I'll... Damn it! Can you think of any reason why this person might want revenge on you or Clorinda? <sighs> the show. You said divorce papers and... I mean, we, we catch spouses in their lies on national television. It has to be the damn show! You know, there was a guy. I, I think his name might just have been Steve. Right at the beginning. Th that, that guy was off his nut. He told us in an interview that he had been with somebody other than his wife. Then he freaked out when we used it in the show. I mean, it was right there in the contract. All interviews are taped, and we have the right to show any of it on the air. He acted like we'd broken confessional or something, but it's not like we ever heard from him again. Yeah, I have a picture from that episode somewhere on our network. I'll send it from my phone. Okay, you should have it now. That ring on his finger looks exactly like the one we pulled out of the hot tub. The pattern of bruising on the victim matches the ring that Steve Tampson wore on Rumors. Let's go talk to Jim. Hey. What evidence do we have? I think linking him to bruises on the victim's body should be enough to get him in here, yeah. We saw a picture of you wearing that ring on rumors, and we know the same ring was worn by Clorinda's killer. Look, I don't know what's up with that picture, but that's not my ring. We looked at that picture up close. It appears to be an authentic screen capture from the first episode of Rumors. You must have brought me in for a better reason than that, right? Probably just got wet or something. I don't know. I didn't do it, though. <laughs> I've never touched her phone. If my girlfriend wants to clean off her phone with my towel, what do I care? You can't explain away your motive. Your divorce papers are dated right after your appearance on the show. And the way that you deface the names indicates quite a bit of rage. Did you hold Clorinda and Ernie responsible when your wife left you? It sounded like your affair was the real reason for that. Did Ernie actually remember me? I'm shocked. Yeah, I was on that show. I was kind of an idiot to talk about cheating on my wife in an interview for a TV show, but they didn't have to put it on the air. It's not like we went all the way. We just made out. I, I would have told her. That they didn't have to ruin my life. Then Clorinda checked into the same rehab clinic as me. <laughs> what are the odds, right? Did she recognize you? She did, totally. Had the nerve to act like it was no big deal, like we were old friends or something. 
She had no idea. So I gotta say, I really did get a kick out of wrecking their marriage, and getting laid for the trouble. How you like your little coward now, Ernie? So you got your revenge, but it wasn't enough. You needed her dead just to get right with the world. Slip some roofies into her drink, maybe gave her a little back rub. When she started to go under, you made sure that she didn't come back up. Hey, whoa, I didn't kill her. I got what I wanted. Why would I risk it? You said, how you like your little coward now? That's an odd turn of phrase. I... he called me that on the show. Cheating bitch. I'll kill you and the little coward you're screwing. A call was made to check that voicemail at 1015. It was in Clorinda's purse, and there are no prints on it. Strange for a shiny phone like that. You said you were alone in your room, at least after you saw Jack. If that's true, Clorinda couldn't have wiped the phone down with your towel, and you never did explain the ring. I think you're an excellent liar, Stephen, but eventually the details fail to connect, even for the best. We all heard you say, little coward. We've got it on tape. Do you really want all this to go to a jury? If you're going to take a fall, don't you want everyone to know your side of it? My side? Yeah, I'll tell you my side. I had the roofies from before rehab. I was going to get rid of them, but then Clorinda showed up. I thought I could use them to get her into bed, but it turned out I didn't even need them. She wanted it. But then last night she pushed me, and I knew I had to end it. Then that idiot showed up with the booze, and I saw my chance. I slipped her the mickey, and went back to my room to get my wedding ring. It didn't fit anymore. Why did you need the ring? I had to show her. I had to show her the love that she had cost me. You think I gave her a back rub, Captain? I shoved that bitch under as hard as I could. I left my ring with her, because I finally didn't need it anymore. And the phone call! The message! I couldn't resist checking what Ernie had to say. I'll tell you, I laughed my ass off. Stephen Tampson, you're under arrest for the murder of Clorinda Jackson. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Well, Steve, no more rehab for you. But they tell me prison has a sobering effect on people. It's you! I should have known all along. Ernie, calm down. I'll be with you in a second. You're that total nut job from the pilot of rumors! Do you know what your wife said that made me drown her? She told me she loved me. I'll kill you, you son of a bitch! Whoa! A little help here! I'll kill you! See, they got the bloodstains cleaned up. Nothing like showing up to your murder trial with a broken nose. Anyway, good job on this case. It was tricky. Steve Tampson had an answer for everything. Except the evidence. So we got a call from the landlord. He says he heard a carbon monoxide alarm go off in here. He checks it, and that's when he finds a running generator and... the great Andrew Levesque. May he rest in peace. I'll bite. What makes the great Andrew so great? Used to call him the Wayne Newton of fire breathers. Wayne Newton? Don Cushain? It was a very popular song. No? Well, anyway, the guy was a local celebrity, at least. I thought he retired. I heard something about cancer. But apparently his cancer was in remission. He was planning a comeback. Was it skin cancer? Because those lesions, they could also be indicative of Carposi sarcoma, an AIDS-related illness. But the landlord mentioned carbon monoxide, huh? Generators do have a reputation for that. But in a room this size? And therein lies your suspicious cirques. You guys worked together before? No. It's our first time. I'll be gentle. You'll want to question the family when you get the chance. It was apparently a substantial insurance policy on the great Andrew's life. 
Okay, I'll leave you both to it. Danke schön. What a mess. I confess. Okay, so the windows were closed, and the generator was running to power those big spotlights there. With no ventilation and no airflow, the carbon monoxide released by the generator's internal combustion engine would diffuse pretty slowly. If Andrew was standing near the generator for a while, the concentration of CO might have been enough to poison him. Human blood. Nice find. Unidentified goo. Always the best kind. Good thinking. If we need to, we can figure out where that gas was purchased from its composition. We need to know how much carbon monoxide that generator puts out, and how much gas it burns. Let's take it back to the garage for testing. Whoa. Bartender, pour me another. That vent is closed just like the others, but it's not on an exterior wall. I bet Dr. Vince knows where it leads. Yes, I know. The detective told me. I'm Dr. Vicente Manotto. I'm the owner of the building. I found Andrew and called the police immediately. It's just so awful, isn't it? I'd say just about an hour ago. That's correct. Actually, I was in another unit when I heard the alarm go off. Yes, I was in another unit, assessing how much of the last tenant's security deposit I should give back. At first I wasn't sure exactly where the alarm was coming from. Then I could hear it was coming from in here. I knocked on the door, but Andrew didn't answer. I went inside, and that's when I found him. Oh my god. Uh, no, I didn't, but I didn't smell a gas leak. Of course, I know carbon monoxide doesn't have an odor. It's just that when I saw Andrew lying there, it struck me that somehow he'd set off the alarm because of all those chemicals he ends up using. Or that maybe it had gone off by itself, accidentally. Frankly, it didn't occur to me in that moment to call anyone but the police. I checked Andrew's pulse. I'm a doctor. I thought if his heart were still beating, I could help him. Other than his immediate family, his wife, and son, I haven't seen anyone else here. Uh, he paid me the rent yesterday. Yes, it is. Good luck with your investigation. I'll call down to the morgue for a pickup. Okay, 
We've got warning signs posted. We've got our oxygen masks. And we've covered half the garage with a giant plastic bag. The conditions inside the gas tent should closely mimic those in Andrew's practice space. And the carbon monoxide detector is positioned about where Andrew's head would have been relative to the generator. All we have to do is fire that puppy up and wait. We should get a good sense of how fast it burns gasoline and how much carbon monoxide it puts out. Care to do the honors? Okay, that's good. Now come back out here where it's safe. We're gonna let it run completely out of gas. It's gonna take a while, so we should come back later. at a sillal terminated polyether and acrylic sealant. Cock. The great Andrew must have been closing up some joints and gaps in his rehearsal space. Although, I'll tell you, if it were me, I'd have the landlord take care of that kind of work. And who's to say Andrew didn't? It's gasoline, all right, with a pretty high ethanol content. Unless I'm wrong, the diethylene triamine is from an aftermarket stabilizer. Allows the fuel to be stored for longer without gumming up. It's a paraffin. With those additives, it's consistent with lamp oil. That makes sense. From what I've read, lamp oil is the least toxic fuel for fire breathing. It's still toxic, just not as bad as the alternatives. The blood sample we took from the generator is a match to a Lyle Fitzer. Jeez, kid's 18 years old. Look at that list of priors. Talk about starting early and often. But how does Lyle Fitzer know? Wait a second. Lyle's home address matches the Levesque address. Mrs. Levesque, I'm very sorry. It's Ms. now, or whatever someone calls a widow. I'm sorry, I, I just can't believe my husband's gone. Never. Andrew was meticulous to a fault, an absolute perfectionist. On occasion, I would help him. Even Lyle would help out every now and again. Lyle, that's my son. Andrew is, uh, was his stepfather. I'm sorry. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Uh, my son and I would help Andrew a bit, move things around, tell him what tricks we preferred, but for the most part, my husband worked alone. 
apart from Andrew, only me and my son. Well, no, our landlord, uh, Dr. Minoto, has a key to the room. He has a key to all the units. No, well, I mean, he was in remission for almost a year now. He had been diagnosed with an oral cancer called squamish cell carcinoma. It was just devastating. The disease, the chemotherapy. He couldn't work, and then later on, no one wanted to hire him back. It wasn't fair. Odessa's ten days old. She's our miracle. We decided to have her after the doctor told Andrew his cancer was in remission. We felt so blessed. No, none whatsoever. And believe me, Andrew would never have agreed to Odessa if he had thought for a single moment he wouldn't be right here with me to help raise her. My husband was beloved, truly. Even when they wouldn't hire him back on the strip, they were always so apologetic. It wasn't personal, they'd say. It was business, times were changing, the end of an era, really. I do? I... we did sign up for some right when we got married. I had completely forgotten. Andrew handled the bills. He's not here right now, but when I see him, I'll make sure he gives you all the help he can. If you need to ask me anything else, anything at all, please feel free. Lyle Fitzer is Andrew's stepson, and at some point he left blood at our crime scene. We should hear what he has to say about his stepfather. What do you need? What evidence do we have? We don't even know if there's been a crime yet, so there's no grounds for a warrant. But it won't hurt to ask him. I thank my mom. I wouldn't be here if she hadn't freaked out when I said I wasn't going. I'm sure it's a tough time for her. But we have to ask. We found your blood on a generator that may have caused your stepfather's death. How did it get there? A generator killed him? He didn't die of cancer? How did a generator kill him? Lyle, your mother said sometimes he would help Andrew practice his performance. But how would your blood get on the generator? I got in a fight at school and I got suspended. Mom said I had to tell Andrew before the school called him. So, last night I went into his rehearsal room, and, and he didn't take it well. He liked to poke and push as punctuation. He'd yell, and then he'd poke, yell, then push. Last night he pushed me so hard I hit my head on the generator. Hurt like a... It hurt, okay? A lot. Pretty great guy, huh? What do you think? But he'd only hit me when he was bored with beating Mom. It must have been very tough for both of you. I'm curious, did you ever think about... Look, I did not kill my stepdad. Believe me, I had every reason to, but I can restrain myself. Not like him. <laughs> Whatever. I can go, right? Hi, Doc Robbins here. Just wanted to let you know that I've completed my autopsy of Andrew Levesque. I'll give you a full report when you come by. Carboxyhemoglobin saturation levels in your victim indicate that he was exposed to carbon monoxide in relation to ambient concentration of about 3,200 parts per million. Death would have occurred in about 30 minutes, but he would have experienced severe headaches, dizziness, and nausea after only 5 or 10. Who hangs around for half an hour feeling like that? Well, that's the other interesting wrinkle. While Mr. Levesque's exposure to carbon monoxide was at a lethal level, he was quite possibly already on his way out. Take a look here. His squamous cell carcinoma had spread to his lungs. It's like a friend of mine once remarked, his cancer had cancer. So he might not have felt much worse than he normally did. At least until he keeled over. Now it's even more important for us to finish our test with the generator. If it could have put out enough carbon monoxide, this might be just an accident. 
No, no mention of it at all. But Mr. Levesque's last visit to the doctor was over six months ago. So obviously his cancer went unchecked and progressed rather aggressively. Well, I'm not sure. Look at what I found in his esophagus. This is a two-part hard gelatin capsule. I couldn't decipher a label, but it could be a cancer-killing pill, or it could be a vitamin supplement. Liver's set, so I'd say he's been dead for approximately four to five hours. No problems at all. Here you are. I did. There's a white substance on his wrist that I left for you. You always did know how to make us feel needed. Also, take a close look at his mouth, the area just around his lesions. There were small concentrations of alkane hydrocarbons in his system, paraffin. Not enough to initiate toxemia, however. I think we've been fairly comprehensive, but if you think of more questions to ask me, I'll answer them if I can. We'll have to verify it, but that looks like makeup to me. That shade's a little dark for him. More white goo. But is it the same white goo we found before? Particulate talc and nylon, silicone oil, sodium hyaluronate, and water. Definitely makeup. Andrew may have been hiding his cancer. The victim's wrist and the cock from the generator are chemically identical. Amniotic fluid? Okay, that's weird. Talk about your alternative forms of medicine. Sugar. They say a spoonful makes the medicine go down, but I think they mean along with, not instead of.
amniotic fluid? Okay, that's weird. Talk about your alternative forms of medicine. The mitochondrial DNA from Lyle's blood is a match to that from the amniotic fluid. Pharmaceutical companies print out some sort of ID number somewhere on the meds themselves. We should be able to look that up. It's methotrexate an anti-metabolite and antifolate drug used in the treatment of autoimmune diseases and cancer. We've got a capsule of cancer meds, but there's no actual medication in it. Mr. Levesque wasn't getting what he thought he was getting. We should double check the tox report with Robbins. He didn't say anything about methotrexate, but we should be sure. Unfortunately for Mr. Levesque, no. Methotrexate might have helped his condition. It's often prescribed as part of a chemotherapy suite. Andrew Levesque was killed by carbon monoxide poisoning, but somebody was trying to kill him by denying him cancer meds. We don't have one crime to solve. We have two. How's the Levesque case going? Did taking over the garage get us anything more than extra paperwork? It did, sort of. We know that the generator wasn't the cause of death. Negative results are still results. Is that all? Well, we're looking at two crimes. Attempted murder by medication denial and some flavor of homicide, negligent or otherwise. Negligent? You thinking of anyone in particular? I like the landlord for it. There are some generator-related holes in his story that don't fit the evidence. Follow that up, but get something conclusive. He's a doctor and a landlord, so he's probably ready to lawyer up if he smells trouble. Now, tell me about the medication denial. Andrew had cancer, no remission about it, and we found a fake cancer pill in his esophagus. Any suspects? We're working on it. Great. Keep me posted. Great. Now let's check the carbon monoxide level on the detector. Sixteen hundred parts per million. The generator didn't put out carbon monoxide fast enough to have killed Andrew. At least not in his gigantic workspace.
It leads to the boiler room. It's centrally located between all my warehouse units. Yes, of course. Well, I don't have keys anymore. I have a key card. All the locks here are electronic now. Can you believe it? Pretty soon we'll just need to talk to the locks, am I right? No, not at all. Please follow me. Please, make yourselves at home. I'll be next door, as I promised. Great. Don't go anywhere. Wow. What a piece of junk. It's gonna take a lot more than cock to fix this furnace. I wonder if it even works. Looks like one of those vents could lead right to the practice space. No prints there. We don't need to make a mold of that. This cock is still tacky. It hasn't been here long. The furnace still works, though. I think we caught our source of carbon monoxide red-handed. I'll have Brass contact the gas company, get him to turn off the gas. Then we'll process the pipe. No prints there. Somebody knows how to make a good impression. Whoa, 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 hold, hold on. We don't want to take that off until the gas company shuts this place down. I don't want to go out like Andrew did. I can't believe this thing still works. Look at how badly it's corroded. That gas can holds five gallons. It's almost empty. No prints there. No prints there. No prints there. No prints there. No surprise there.
The gas from the can in the boiler room is an exact match to the gas from the generator. Same ethanol content, same stabilizing additive. We have a match. So we know Dr. Vince handled the gas can from the boiler room at some point. Looks like Dr. Minoto cocked that pipe. Okay, right now we have two possible scenarios. One, someone cranks up the furnace knowing that the leak in the pipe will flood the rehearsal space with carbon monoxide. Once our fire breather has taken his last breath, our perp comes in, seals the leak with caulk, and tries to tidy up the scene, but instead deposits traces of caulk all over the room, including on the victim. Or two, completely by accident, or what I like to call criminal negligence, the leak in the furnace floods the room with CO, overwhelming the great Andrew. Then someone comes into the room, sees the victim dead on the floor, and decides to make it look like natural causes. In both cases, our not-so-ingenious perp thought we'd think the generator was the source of the CEO. And in both cases, I gotta say, I really like our not-so-good Dr. Minoto. Looks like Dr. Vince has a record. Nevada law makes possession of any amount of marijuana by someone under the age of 21 a felony. So, unfortunately for Dr. Minoto, he was a 20-year-old pre-med when he was busted. He was sentenced to one year in prison, 750 hours of community service, and paid a $5,000 fine. And he still got accepted to medical school, so no harm, no foul, right? However, recently the doctor did run afoul of the Las Vegas Housing and Building Commission. He was cited on several occasions for improper maintenance of that apartment building. Here. Take a look. Dr. Minoto paid nearly $12,000 in building code violations. And check out his last citation. Failing to upgrade gas pipes, posing a serious threat of carbon monoxide exposure. Talk about your slumlord millionaire who's about to be charged with negligent homicide. Yeah? We think someone may have been tampering with Mr. Levesque's medication. Do you have enough evidence? Mitochondrial DNA is not definitive, but the likelihood of two recently pregnant women matching up to Lyle is small enough that I should be able to convince a judge. How dare you come back here? Ma'am, we have a warrant. I don't understand you people. Why are you doing this to me? little bit of blood there and something else
No trace fluids there. whole bottle of methotrexate right on the nightstand. It seems unlikely that Ardell would have missed that. It's prescribed to a Jeremy Proxmire. I'll have Brass run that name down. More amniotic fluid. More amniotic fluid. Wow. Sugar in every single pill. I wonder if the meds were tampered with at the source. More amniotic fluid. Different capsule, same DNA on the outside, Ardell's. I think I'm starting to understand how the amniotic fluid got on the pills. Picture this. Andrew is dispensing his pills when Ardell's water breaks. Since this is apparently his first kit, he freaks out in a rush to get her to the hospital. In the process, he drops his pills, some of which land in a puddle of amniotic fluid.
Maybe we'll have better luck with a different magnification. What if we try zooming in or out? Can't see what we're looking for at this magnification. Let's try another setting. The capsule we found at the Levesque house has the same ID number as the pill Andrew tried to swallow. Tracked down Jeremy Proxmire. Turned out to be a reported case of identity theft. Fed shut down a big phishing operation that was selling social security numbers on the internet. But get this, the only hit on Jeremy's social was a prescription for methotrexate sent from an online pharmacy based in Canada. The identification number attached to the prescription belonged to a Dr. Vicente Manotto. The landlord. Now, the good doctor reported a script pad stolen the same week as all this went down, but the coincidences are piling up. Hey. We think Dr. Minotto may be responsible for the carbon monoxide in the building. I'm going to need to see some evidence before I go to a judge. Yeah, that's what I thought. Let's bring him in. I don't think so. Those pipes were all in good working order. Dr. Minotto, can you explain to us why, despite being cited by the city, you failed to repair the gas pipes in your building? Uh, you misunderstand. I hadn't failed to repair them. I was just in the middle of accepting bids from contractors. I couldn't very well repair them all by myself, right? Yes, I paid a few fines, but uh, in this particular case with regard to the gas lines, you'll see right there I did not exceed the deadline. No, I didn't touch the pipe. Dr. Minoto, we know you put caulk on the pipe in the boiler room. I can't explain that. I... I don't remember touching the furnace, but if I did, then it must have been when I was checking it. But that would have been several days ago. The caulking was wet, Dr. Minotto. It was fresh, and it was lathered on. I'd say you should have waited for a professional to do the job. All oh, right. Perhaps I did put caulk on the pipe. I'm trying to maintain the building. That doesn't make me responsible for Andrew's death. Let's get serious, Dr. Minotto. You know you were negligent, and you tried to cover it up. I did not kill Andrew. He was a good man, a good tenant. The man played with fire, literally. I ran a generator in a closed room. There must be something you're missing. No, of course not. The generator was running when I arrived. We matched the gas from the generator to what was in your gas can in the boiler room. Yours were the only prints on it. Please, stop, okay? i tell you what happened. I'll tell you everything. As I told you before, I heard the carbon monoxide alarm coming from Andrew's practice space. I knocked, but when nobody answered, I used my keycard. Andrew was lying there. I did check his pulse, just as I said, but there was nothing. He was dead. I was scared, in shock. All I could think about was that citation from the city for those damn pipes, and I knew someone would hold me responsible for Andrew's death. 
I panicked. I got some cock out and did my best to seal off the cracks in the pipe. I brought the gasoline I had been storing to the practice space and used it to fill the generator Andrew used to power lights during his outdoor performances. Andrew himself gave me the idea. He had told me once that he would never run the generator indoors for fear of poisoning himself. I rolled the generator to the middle of the room, started it, then moved the body under the lights they powered. Then I called the police. Accidents will happen, but why don't I think we have the whole picture? I told you everything I know, I swear. I don't know any Jeremy Proxmire. Don't know any Jeremy Proxmire. I think I do have an answer for that, actually. My prescription pad was stolen. I filed a police report. That might explain how Andrew got a hold of a prescription for methotrexate. But it doesn't tell us why every single pill in that bottle is filled with sugar and nothing else. Sugar? What? Oh no. I promised to keep a secret, not to cover up condemning Andrew to a slow death. Andrew came to me. He feared, justly, that his cancer had returned. His health had already jeopardized his career once, and our public admission of a relapse would end it for sure. I advised him to seek specialized treatment, but he wouldn't hear of it. I genuinely wanted to help him. As I said before, Andrew was a good tenant. So I explained which drug would help his condition, and then I may have left my pad lying around where someone could take it. Which is a diplomatic way of saying you gave the pad to Andrew and then reported it stolen to cover your own hide. You're right that I reported it stolen about a week later. But I didn't give the pad to Andrew. I gave it to Ardell. What do you need? I'll see what I can do. Show me the evidence. A bottle full of tampered medication, plus witness testimony that Ardell was given the prescription pad, that should be enough to get her in here. I am trying to be patient. I am trying to understand how you're conducting your investigation. But why would you drag me down here like this, like I'm some sort of common criminal? Ms. Levesque, according to Dr. Minotto, you used his script pad to prescribe cancer pills for Andrew. He's wrong. You have no proof of that. Even if Andrew did have cancer pills, I certainly had nothing to do with them. That can't be true. If Andrew was taking medication, I would have known. I was never aware of any pills. What are those? If those pills were in our house, I certainly never touched them. I was never aware of any pills. We found your DNA on Andrew's pills, Miss Levesque. You must have known about them. Oh my god, I, I can't explain it. You can't, or you won't? Okay, look, I knew about the pills, yes. I knew that his cancer had come back. But what were we supposed to do? Andrew could hardly find work when people thought he was in remission. How was he supposed to support us if people knew his cancer had come back? Dr. Minota was kind enough to help us, even though he could have lost his license. Dr. Vince's Heart of Gold doesn't explain your amniotic fluid on the pills. No, it doesn't. That was something else. Andrew didn't like me to see him take his medicine. He said it made him feel weak. The night Odessa was born, I approached him in the bedroom. 
I guess I didn't realize he was about to take a pill. I surprised him, and he turned around and pushed me, spilling his pills on the floor. He stormed out. I don't think he even realized that the fall made me go into labor. Tampa with them? How do you mean? The contents of the pills were emptied and replaced with sugar. What? That's crazy! I never emptied his pills! Violent? Not that often, but sometimes. He was very passionate. At first, he put all that energy into his work. It's why he was famous. But when he got cancer, when he couldn't work with fire, all that emotion had to go somewhere. Hey, I'm not some poor, lost, abused wife. My husband was a wonderful man who got a raw deal. If we could have only stopped the cancer, everything would have been fine. If he did, neither one of them told me about it. Lyle said that's how his blood ended up at the crime scene. I guess I suspected something. Lyle, I love my son, but I can't always control him. When I married Andrew, I thought it would be good for Lyle to have a strong male role model. But I don't think Lyle ever really accepted Andrew's authority. What are you talking about? He was my husband! I didn't start that leak! I try not to limit myself. Come on back to my office, we can discuss it. When we took Miss Levesque into custody, she checked this handbag into property. Law says that her possessions at the time of arrest are admissible as evidence, so I thought her stuff might tell you more than she did. Cyclopyrox. We'll have to look up exactly what that is, but it was prescribed by a Dr. Vicente Minotto to a Mr. Lyle Fitzer. Her apartment's lock uses a traditional key. Only the boiler room for the practice space requires a key card. It makes sense that Dr. Minotto would have one, but why would Miss Levesque? They don't come much cleaner than that, at least not without ink. Right now, it almost looks like we have a conspiracy murder between two people who didn't even know they were conspiring. Ardell and Dr. Vince. You have a manslaughter confession from Dr. Minotto, which his lawyer will definitely try to toss. Plus, Ardell Levesque lawyered up as soon as we brought up the medication tampering. I feel rotten about that. Child Protection Services will take care of Odessa, but who wants to be separated from her newborn? Honestly, I hope the fraud charge doesn't stick. I don't know. I think Mrs. Levesque isn't talking because she's hoping we can't close the deal on an attempted murder charge. You know, she was definitely involved with the prescription fraud, but it doesn't mean she's the one who emptied the medication. Okay, that perfectly formed print on the keycard belongs to Lyle Fitzer. Hmm, I wonder if Ardell's keeping Mom to protect her son and not just herself. Cyclopyrox is a synthetic antifungal agent intended for topical dermatologic use. Hey, brass again. 
Gas company turned off the gas in Dr. Minoto's building. You can go back to process the pipe. Cyclopurox, just like it says on the label. Hard as a rock. If we try to pull it off now, we'll take half the pipe with it. I know just who to call. I'll put it on speaker. This is Stokes. Hey Nick, quick question. You ever moved cock from a pipe before? Aren't you supposed to be back at the crime scene? I am back at the crime scene. I need to remove some cock from a pipe. Do you know how to do it? Okay, basically you need two things. A heat gun and some denatured alcohol. A heat gun and denatured alcohol? You know, I can't say those are standard issue with the field kit. How am I- Don't worry, I'll be right over. Great. We aren't going anywhere. That was tricky. I'm glad I'm not a contractor. What? You don't like showing up at noon and making boatloads of money? I just don't like removing caulk. So thanks for your help. Anytime. Good luck with the pipe. We don't need to make a mold of that. Someone cut a hole in that pipe. I'm beginning to think Dr. Minotto's Mia Culpa was just a ploy to avoid murder one. Looks like a bit of fingernail. We might or might not be able to get a DNA sample from that depending on whether it took any skin with it. I definitely want to get a closer look at that discoloration though. Hey, Nick. Hey, how's it going? I've got something that might be right up your alley. This case I'm working on has some serious conspiracy theory vibes. What's got me stuck right now is this piece of 19th century parchment. I think there's some kind of code in the text, but I can't figure it out. Care to give it a shot? Palimpsest. There was something written on this parchment, then scraped off and written over, maybe more than once. I can see the words, all seven of them, but they don't make any sense. Seven more nonsense words. Nick's right, it's got to be a code of some sort. Seven words again. There's got to be some kind of pattern there. Maybe we should try the first letter of each word from each hidden page. But in what order? Five layers so far. How many are there? A 
another layer, more nonsense. Have you noticed a pattern to the colors of light we've used? What color of the rainbow haven't we done yet? Seven colors in the rainbow and seven words per page of hidden data. Seems to suggest an order in which to place the letters. Let's write them all down. We've solved your parchment puzzle, Nick. It was a palimpsest. So there was hidden text underneath what we could see? Seven layers of it. And that was in code. You want to know what it said? Nah, I'd rather wait for the movie. Okay, okay. Please, tell me what you found. Seek the Star of the North in the home of our glorious leader. Hey, that's great. I don't know what it means yet, but at least it's something else to chew on. Well, there's nothing there that would give us a DNA sample, but those growths are consistent with a fungal infection. We have a fingernail loaded with fungus and a prescription for an antifungal agent made out to Lyle Fitzer. Maybe Lyle couldn't restrain himself after all. Captain, we've just flipped our case on its head. Let me guess, the butler did it. How'd you know? Actually, we're thinking it was the stepson. Hey. We think he may have tampered with the furnace pipe at his stepfather's practice space. Based on what evidence? Well, we already have a warrant to search the house for signs of medication tampering. It shouldn't be too difficult to get the parameters expanded in light of this new evidence. And this must be Lyle's room. Just a guess. We're looking for a tool. Something that could have punched a hole in those rusty pipes. Probably a chisel from the look of the mold we took. But let's not assume. Chisel. thinking. The knife blades are a little smaller than our mold, but he might have tried using it. There could be trace. Nothing interesting there. Dr. Minoto's negligence wasn't responsible for the carbon monoxide leak. Lyle broke the pipe open. I always wondered if people actually use those things to pick their teeth. There's something on the end of it. White powder. That could be a lot of things. Very few of them good. The residue on the toothpick is methotrexate. Lyle was tampering with his stepfather's medication. 
Yeah? That search warrant played out, huh? Show me what you got. One attempted murder warrant coming up. You know, the toothpick you used to empty out your stepfather's cancer medication? So what? He didn't die of cancer. It's still attempted murder. Yeah, okay. I admit it. You want to know the best day of my life? The day I heard Andrew got cancer. You want to know the worst day of my life? Every day after that was a tie. So, I decided to make sure that nothing would stop that cancer from doing its thing. I'd pop open those pills, and I'd pour out that crap, and I'd pray. I don't know anything about a leak. I didn't do it with my bare hands, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have the guts to kill that son of a bitch with my bare hands. Did my mom tell you what happened the day Odessa was born? Yes. He pushed her and induced her labor. What kind of person does that, huh? Oh my god, I should have killed him right then. But my mother was about to give birth, so I drove her right to the hospital. And then, do you know what he had the nerve to do? He came to the hospital like nothing had ever happened. He came to the hospital to watch his real child be born. I bought a hammer and the chisel that afternoon. I chipped away at that pipe just enough so it looked like corrosion. I wanted to get away with it. Yes, I did. Because I wanted to be able to get away with my mother and little sister as far away from this city as possible. So I tried to make it sort of look like if anyone was responsible, it was that slumlord Dr. Minoto. I'm sure he deserved to be in jail for something anyway. I probably told myself I was doing you guys a favor. I don't know. You know, there was another way out of this. You could have called us. Seriously, like my mother would ever press charges against that bastard? <laughs> no way. Jeez, she was always seeing in his eyes how he changed, or how he was about to change, or, or how Odessa had changed him. There was only one way our lives were going to change. I was sick, and I was tired. Sometimes he'd brag about how what didn't kill me would make me stronger. Well, he was right about that, I guess. I really didn't care about anything, except killing him. Maybe you should have thought a little bit more about your mother, and Odessa. You don't think she's gonna need her brother? I did the best I could, for both of them. You two did a great job on this case. It was quite a maze. But all roads ultimately led to Lyle. I feel sorry for Miss Levesque. Her life has been turned upside down. She's lost her husband, her son is going to jail for murder, and she just had a baby. There is a bright side. Jim talked to the DA's office and they have no interest in pursuing the prescription fraud case. Then both Ardell and Dr. Vince go free? Ms. Levesque has already left, but we still have Dr. Minetto in custody for tampering with the crime scene. He might not have meant any harm, but he still made our job harder than it needed to be. I'm hungry. Either of you interested in breakfast? I don't have a positive ID yet, but I think we may be looking at Mr. Floyd Collister, also known as Marcel, the Grand Dame of the Las Vegas Female Impersonators. You a fan? Mrs. Doubtfire is more my taste. The smell of booze is pretty strong. Well, I imagine Floyd's probably in his mid to late 70s, so if he tied one on last night, Accidents will happen, along with maybe a stroke or a heart attack. Yeah, you're right. 
I mean, you might really be right about tying one on. See her, his wrists? Looks like ligature marks. Someone wanted to make sure their drinking buddy didn't leave too soon. Didn't leave until he was dead. She, you mean, until she was dead. I'm just saying. Hey, good to see you. I can always depend on the kindness and assistance of my fellow CSIs. I just got started. You're welcome to jump in on the scene with me, or you can talk to our one and only witness over there. You mean how she died? Well, at first blush, it's tough to say. It could be natural causes, but the special cirques are those ligature marks on the wrists and ankles. We'll know more once we get her over to Doc Robbins. Doesn't look like it. There's cash in the register, and nothing really stands out as being out of place or missing. It's been around a pretty long time. I remember I almost had my bachelorette party here. Not that my bachelorette party was that long ago, but... Anyway. After you. No prints there. Someone's gotten into the whiskey. Nice work. Our victim has tentatively been identified as Floyd Collister, but apparently he's better known as Marcel. Brass says he's known to be one of the best female impersonators in Las Vegas. I believe the term he used was Grand Dame. Oh, yes, the good stuff. Let's just make sure it gets back to the lab. In the bottle. You can smell the alcohol, right? PAC might have contributed to the death. Hello, sir. We're with the Las Vegas Crime Lab. Can we get your name? Sure. Name's Gary Beaumont. I've been pretty much a regular here for, gosh, 30 years. Give or take, right? Everybody knows me. I even have my own chair over there. That's mine. Nobody else gets to sit there but my butt. I found her, yes. I showed up about nine o'clock for Bloody Mary Sundays. That's what Marcel calls it. And I I'm walking in and passing right by the stage and, and that's when I saw her face down. I got up there, and I tried to wake her up, but she wasn't breathing, and I couldn't save her. I, I don't have any kind of training. I, I, I used to know CPR, but, you know, I, I just called 911. That's all I thought I could really do. 
Besides Mr. Collister, that is. Mr. Collister? I'm sorry, don't you mean Marcel? Yes, sorry. It's a bit confusing. Marcel. I, I didn't mean to jump on you. It's just that Marcel was truly a lady. The most kind, gracious, generous, loving, feminine spirit I've ever known. As for Floyd Collister, that person's dead to me. Well, she did own a bar. I mean, I suppose you don't have to drink to own a bar, but, but Marcel did. Drink and own a bar. Both. She also smoked like a chimney. Well, if a chimney smoked a pack and a half in that Sherman's a day, anyway. Miss Apprehension scolded her about it all the time. I'm sorry. I wasn't quite clear whether Marcel was having some misapprehension about her health, or there's actually a person named Miss Apprehension? Oh, no. She's not a person. She's a diva. The divine Miss A. She's been performing at the club for... Well, for as long as I've been here. But you probably never heard of her, because Marcel only let one star shine here. Hers. Do you know Miss Apprehension's real name? You probably want me to say her real name is Wallace Biganowski, but she'll always be Miss A to me. Would you say they got along? Oh, no. No, no. Oil and water. Cats and dogs, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. I mean, those two fought constantly, but they needed each other. Marcel was the star around here, but she was just awful with money. Miss A kept this place in business. Do things ever get violent between the two of them? No, never. They yelled a lot, but I think they really loved each other. Oh no, poor Miss A. She'll be devastated when she finds out. I should probably try to find her in case she needs a shoulder to cry on. Let me think. No, that's really all that stands out to me. If I remember something, can I call you? Do you have a card? You don't think they'll close the club down, do you? I'm tempted, but no. Looks like Marcel forgot to take her pills. like this Wallace Beganowski is angling for partial ownership in this club. And judging by this note, the negotiations aren't going well. I'll have Doc Robbins send someone down to pick up the body. alcohol in the victim matches the alcohol in the bottle, which means it was a classic cork party. The pills were recovered at the scene were prescribed to Floyd Collister. Your hydramazine, it's a heart medication. So, if we run an extended tox panel and find him in Marcel's system, That'd be positive ID.
Whoa, so that's what Marcel looks like in the morning before she puts on her face. She's been a fixture in this town for as long as I can remember, but I don't think anyone's seen her like this, at least not in public. We pulled her, well, Floyd Collister's DMV records. He was born in 1938, which means Marcel is 71 years old, but she looks much younger, don't you think? Well, what time taketh away, cosmetic surgery giveth back, to some degree anyway. I'll check her medical records for the precise number of procedures. Okay. You know, I hate to be a stickler for detail about this, but we haven't really positively identified this victim. We didn't recover any form of identification on the body or at the scene. So before we go any further, let's just make sure this is Marcel or Floyd Collister or whoever or whatever. All right? I love the easy ones. Here you go. You know, they say celebrity deaths come in threes. I'm certainly not anxious to see another. Here, I found some skin under the victim's fingernails. I collected a sample for DNA. I guess Marcel may have gotten a piece of her killer. What can you tell us about those contusions around his wrists and ankles? Well, they're definitely consistent with ligature marks. The development of the bruising suggests the victim was restrained anti-mortem. I also noticed a larger contusion on the back of her head, also anti-mortem. She might have been struck from behind. She died of respiratory depression due to alcohol poisoning. It's as though she were tied down and then the alcohol strangled her. Terrible. Hmm. But it's possible that all this could have been just a horrible accident, right? Actually, I don't think it's possible. Respiratory or heart failure usually occurs when one's blood alcohol level is somewhere around 0.4%. Now, most people in relatively good health tend to pass out around 0.3. Marcel's BAC was 0.5.5%. I don't believe there's any way someone at her age, even as healthy as she seemed to be, could have consumed that much alcohol on her own. Force-fed alcohol. It's like some fraternity prank gone bad. Yeah, but it actually reminds me of a serial killer case my boss, when I first started here, used to talk about a lot. What did they call the guy? The Barber Street Boozer. The Barber Street Boozer. Yeah, wasn't that in the mid-70s? I think 1975? I was a little girl, but I kind of remember people talking about him. Well, I'm sure it seemed particularly deviant at the time. What was it? Four Johns trolling for transvestite prostitutes. They wind up dead, all of them force-fed alcohol. You know, if I'm not mistaken, all four of those murders occurred in the same neighborhood as Marcel's cabaret, and the Barber Street boozer... Never got caught. You could have a cold case on your hands. I'll put in the request for the cold case files on the Barber Street boozer. It'll be worth it just to see if there are any other similarities between this case and those unsolved. We're looking for any sign of the drug, hydramazine. Hydramazine? It's a heart medication that works to expand the blood vessels. I don't see any evidence that this victim was using it, though. So that's not Floyd Collister. Just what we need. An impersonator of an impersonator. Oh, good. You're still here. I just don't feel like being anywhere else right now. This place always felt like home, but now that Marcel's dead, I, I just don't know. We're hoping you can help us with a case of mistaken identity. Oh, what do you mean? Would you mind coming down to the coroner's office with us? Sure, I, I can do that. But you mean it might not be Marcel? I don't understand. But sure, no problem, whatever you need, I I I'll come with you right now. That's not... Oh, no! That's not Marcel! It's not. Do you know who it is, Mr. Beaumont? But, but I saw her! I saw her with my own eyes, I'm telling you! But this... Oh, dear God, that's Wally! I can't believe it, that's Wally Beganowski! I mean, I mean, misapprehension! What the hell's going on? Mr. Beaumont, we're so very sorry. And we deeply appreciate your help. 
I can give you the name of someone if you need someone to talk to right now. And I promise we'll be in touch. Okay? Thank you. Well, looks as though Marcel just went from being our victim to being our prime suspect. I'll have Brass track down her home address and put a bolo out on her car. Or rather, his car, since it's still registered under Floyd Callister. While he's covering that, why don't we check out Mr. Biganowski's home? See what we can find there. Love what you've done with the place. Well, certainly defies stereotypes. Yeah, I can see why you called me for backup. Tough neighborhood. Las Vegas Crime Lab, freeze! Hands where I can see them, now! <coughs> <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Floyd Collister. Don't, don't shoot, please. Mr. Collister, we're here investigating the murder of Wallace Biganowski. Can you tell us where you were last night? <coughs> I can't, I, I can't talk right now. <coughs> I forgot them back there. I'm supposed to take them every day. <coughs> Riley, could you take Mr. Callister to get his medication? We'll stay and process the scene. I'm on it. Riley will call us when she gets back to the station. In the meantime, let's see if Wally or Floyd left behind anything useful. That's the cigarette Collister was smoking. Could come in handy if we need his DNA. That's Floyd Collister's DNA. Quite the homemaker. Somebody never finish unpacking? It's password protected. We shouldn't use it without a reason anyway. I wonder if it's homemade.
Hey, I can't speak for Marcel, but Floyd Collister is going to be all right, and he's ready to talk. Come over to PD when you've wrapped up the scene. Mr. Collister, Wallace Biganowski was murdered in your club. He was found wearing your stage costume. Do you know why he would be dressed as your character, Marcel? It's not a costume, and Marcel is not a character. I am Marcel. I would appreciate it if you would address me properly. I apologize. I meant no disrespect to your authority, but I felt you were demonstrating a disrespect for me, that's all. I, I understand. You have a very difficult job to do. As for Wally, Wally spent nearly a lifetime in my shadow. For a time, we were rivals, but eventually he assumed the role of my understudy in the cabaret show. He was quite good at becoming me, uh, the voice, the manner, and as you are obviously aware, my health is deteriorating, and I wanted, if something untimely should happen to me, I wanted him to take over, to carry on as Marcel. Is that why Mr. Biganowski had plastic surgery? To look more like you, just in case? That was part of it, of course. I, I suspect it was also a bit of unhealthy idol worship on Wally's part, but I saw no reason to dissuade him from trying to improve himself. This question just sounds weird in my head, but here goes. Marcel, why were you hiding in Mr. Biganowski's closet? I was hiding from the murderer. Now, when you two showed up, I suppose the closet may have been a Freudian slip. Look, I'm not trying to be cute here. I had gone back to the club after we'd closed to get my heart medication, which I'd forgotten. When I walked in, I saw Wally lying there up on the stage. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I got scared, really scared. Certainly wasn't my finest hour, I will admit that. <laughs> but if someone was trying to kill Marcel, then I needed to hide somewhere I wouldn't be found. I saw Wally lying there, yes. I saw those dreadful bruises on his wrists and on his ankles. I saw the bottle of booze and I knew... I know Wally doesn't drink. Well, not like that. The very fact of the matter is, over the years I've received death threats. A considerable number of them, so many that I stopped taking them seriously. I figured I can't stop being who I really am. And Better to die in heels, anyway. But you know, maybe I should have taken those threats more seriously. I should have at least talked to Wally about them. That's what I should have done. Why didn't you call the police? Oh, honey, who gives a damn about an old f... <laughs> no. I will not use that abominable word. It's not right. Let me just say, ma'am, that my experience with law enforcement over the years has not given me the greatest confidence that justice will be served for either me or my community. I understand, Marcel, but times are changing. Sure they are, but you think about how much they've really changed the next time you're walking down the street just holding hands with your man. Then you try to imagine someone like me doing the same thing. Look. I was wrong, but I did what I did. I panicked and I ran away. I ran away to Wally's apartment and I hid there. I guess I was thinking something like the killer would realize his mistake and keep coming after me. Marcel, for the time being, for your own safety, we're not going to disclose the fact that you're alive. That is, if that's all right with you. No, but it wouldn't have been a bad idea. In fact, I didn't touch a drop of alcohol all night. Wally and I were very close. Always. Seems like there was tension between the two of you after all. Once Wally saw himself becoming me, well, uh, he started to become unreasonable. It was still my club. He was the manager. And he did a superb job in that capacity. But I did not want to share everything with him. Oh, he started threatening to leave. Oh, <laughs> so much drama. But I know he would have straightened things out. We always did. For better or worse, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. 
For all our ups and downs, Wally and I never stop being friends. I've been staying at his place for the last couple of months. I was there last night, waiting for him to come home. I don't think so, but no, wait. I was using his computer. I was chatting with a few old friends. Don't they call it I Emming? Anyway, I can give you Wally's password. I'm sure if you take a look at the computer, you will be able to verify what I am saying. All right, Marcel. We'll do that. We'll bring Wally's computer back to the lab, and we should be able to confirm whether Marcel was online or not. Well, if the clock on the wall is right, then Marcel was at Wally's apartment at the time of the murder. We looked at Wally's computer like you suggested, and we saw that you were indeed using it all evening. I always was the innocent one. With this killer on the loose, though, I don't know that I feel safe leaving just yet. I'm happy to help any way I can. Nothing comes to mind. Yeah, I have some good news. We are able to dig up all the old Barber Street Boozer case files for you. They were buried down in Central Property. I had them sent over to the lab. Let me know if you find anything. What's up, Ray? Ray? Oh, sorry. I didn't hear you come in. I understand you may have a serial killer who's come out of retirement. I was curious. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. We could use your expertise, actually. Right now, we're just fishing. There's no evidence linking the previous Barber Street Boozer murders to the murder of Floyd Callister. You mean Wallace Biganowski, don't you? Actually, we're trying to keep that information on a need to know, for the time being. Okay, well, in looking through the old case files, we have four male victims, each one from a different race and socioeconomic background. Each was married. Now, the common thread that ties these men together is the desire to explore their homosexual tendencies through the apparent safety of a male presenting himself as a female. There were several, actually, which was part of the problem back in 1975. But here's something interesting for you. Out of the LVPD's top four suspects, two are now deceased, and the other two are going to be very familiar to you. You're kidding. Floyd Callister and Wallace Biganowski. According to this police report, both of them had been arrested multiple times for solicitation, as well as lewd and lascivious behavior in public. Yes, there is. We have 10 cards for both Floyd Collister and Wallace Biganowski, and we have a bottle of unidentified alcohol. If we were able to match brands of alcohol from yesterday and today, it might mean we're dealing with the same serial killer. Or a copycat. I should get back. Riley thinks I'm picking up lunch. Give me a call if you need me. Thank you.
Serial killers are certainly creatures of habit, as well as ritual. The liquor used to poison the four men in 1975 was classic cork whiskey, which is the same brand that was used to kill Walls Beganowski last night. I'm going to ask Brass to help us get in touch with the detectives who worked the original Barber Street Boozer murders. Maybe they can help us better contextualize some of this evidence. Yeah? Do you think there's any way we can talk to the detectives who originally worked the Barber Street murder cases? Detectives Glenn Krautman and Warice Briggs. Glenn died of prostate cancer six years ago, and Warice just retired. I hear you had some input on her final case. She lives out in Boulder City. I'll get her number and have her come down. Hopefully, she might have held on to some of her original case notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out here. It's the least I can do. I thought you might try to get in touch with me. I saw the news. Floyd Collister murdered in his own club. The news didn't give me any details, but you think it might be the boozer, don't you? Or a copycat. The M.O. is similar. Male victim forced to ingest a toxic level of distilled alcohol. Murder took place in the same neighborhood as well. The M.O., as I said, is similar, but it's not exactly the same. This victim isn't married, nor was he someone who could be described as a closeted homosexual. The one that got away. The most frustrating case I ever worked, and my biggest regret, for so many reasons. Glenn and I worked as hard as we could to close this case. But I have to tell you the truth. The department, at that time, did not consider the boozer the highest priority. That's right. It's shameful. But there it is. I can only imagine what we might have been able to do if some people's hearts and minds had been different back then. Fortunately, for whatever reason, the boozer decided to stop on his own. Glenn and I both believed the killer was most likely someone merely posing as a transvestite prostitute in order to lure his victims. But witness testimony kept pushing us toward a couple of actual prostitutes, one of whom was Mr. Collister, and the other was a young man named Wally Biganowski. And I believe later on, those two gentlemen opened up a rather popular nightclub together. We've gone over the suspect file, but we're wondering if there's someone else we might be overlooking. There was this one guy. I'd have to go through my notes here to recall his name exactly. I thought he was particularly interesting, but I'll admit it might have been feminine intuition or something ridiculous like that, because Glenn didn't agree with me, so I kept it out of our official reports. What was intuition telling you about this guy? As I can recall, and you should definitely go over my notes here, these are the originals. This fella had been charged with assaulting one of the victims maybe four months before the murders began. Let's see if I can remember the scenario for you. So this John comes down to the neighborhood looking for some love for sale. He ends up picking up a prostitute outside a club on Barber Street, and this prostitute is dressed like a lady. But before they could get down to doing their business, my suspect, whom I remember thought of himself as a kind of knight in shining armor, swoops down and beats this John up pretty good, defending the honor of this lady. Suspect Gary Beaumont, arrested October 12th, 1975, assault, victim Lon Muskie. Muskie was in the act of soliciting another male for the purpose of prostitution. Muskie released from police custody, not charged. Let me get this straight. Gary attacks this guy, Muskie, and a few weeks later, Muskie becomes one of the Barbara Street boozer victims. And then, 35 years later, who should discover our latest victim but Gary Beaumont. Well, Brass ran Gary Beaumont through the system, but he has no known address. Brass put out a bolo, but I'm hoping we can find Gary ourselves. I'm sure it won't hurt to talk to Mr. Beaumont again, but I agree with Warice's partner. He's not your man. What makes you say that? The Barber Street boozer obviously felt homicidal rage towards his victims. Married men who were secretly soliciting sex from male prostitutes dressed as women. Wallace Biganowski was an unmarried, openly gay female impersonator. Based on the circumstances surrounding Mr. Beaumont's assault charge, I'd say he was the kind of man who would have wanted to protect Wally, not hurt him, and certainly not kill him. Well, from what I saw of Mr. Beaumont's behavior at the crime scene and at the morgue, 
He would have to be a supremely talented actor. He was on an emotional roller coaster. Maybe. For a serial killer, murder is an addiction. Recovery requires a lifelong commitment to some deliberate strategy of behavior modification. And unfortunately, there is no 12-step program for cold-blooded killing. So serial killers usually stop when they're caught or they die. In my professional opinion, if Gary Beaumont is a serial killer, it's difficult to believe that he just decided one day to stop cold turkey. You're probably right, Ray, but I still think we should bring him in just in case. Cover all the bases. And if Beaumont's been such a loyal customer all these years, maybe Marcel knows where he likes to hang out when he's not at the cabaret. I'll bring him right up to interrogation. Gary? You think Gary had something to do with this? We just want to ask him a few more questions, that's all. Gary's harmless. I mean, he's a pain in the ass, because he's always just hanging around needing attention, but he couldn't really hurt anybody, I don't think. He gets thrown out of some places because... He's awkward, a, a, a little strange. Ugh, sometimes he smells, but it's... <clears throat> he's homeless. I wanted to help him, but I never really had the time, you know? I mean, I, I didn't bother him when I found him pretty much living in the alley behind the club. Marcel, were you aware that back in 1975, Floyd Collister was on a list of suspects in the Barber Street murders? Yes, Floyd used to get into a lot of trouble with the police. He was a hooker and he took drugs. But, like I said, that's not the real reason why the police thought he was a deviant. Anyway, that's all water under the bridge now, isn't that right? He cooperated fully, as I recall, answered all the questions. They let him go, and after that, I decided that Floyd should <clears throat> move on, and he did. If I told you that out of the four male prostitutes that were identified as possible suspects back then, you're the only one left alive, what would you say to that? Ma'am, you're wrong. They're all dead. I'm sorry. But I really have nothing more to say to you. Hey, what's going on? Classic cork, huh? Gary, for a homeless guy, you sure have expensive taste in booze. Hand over the bottle, Gary. Yeah, of course, here. Why, what's wrong? Why are you looking at me like that, huh? Not exactly a four-star hotel. It's a love letter to Wally, from Gary. It would have taken at least this much alcohol to kill Biganowski. What do you think? We'll need to process it. Could have been used to tie up our victim.
Hmm, that's peculiar. Lon Muskie's name was written down in a different type of ink stock. Tell you what, I'll buy you dinner if that DNA doesn't come back a match to our victim. No prints there. That's just where Gary was holding the bottle. Told you. Too bad about dinner. Maybe next time. He practically lives at the club and he found Biganowski's body, but I have no idea why his prints would be on a case of booze nowhere near the crime scene. What do you need? I'm gonna need to see some evidence before I go to a judge. Gary's got access to the club, and that bottle of classic cork might as well be a smoking gun, right? You bet we're bringing him in. I'll have Ray join you in interrogation. I think this is right up his alley. Mr. Beaumont, we found your fingerprints on a case of whiskey in Marcel's club. What can I say? I, I saw the case on the floor. It was already open. I needed it. My hands, they were shaking so bad. I just needed that drink so badly. But Gary, that was the same whiskey used to poison Mr. Biganowski. What? I just needed a drink. I didn't use it to kill Wally. It makes us think you're keeping other things from us. No, it, it's not like I always sleep there. I try to stay at the shelter, but sometimes it's full. So I have to stay where I can, where I don't bother anybody. Open your mouth, please. Yes, of course. Ah. Uh... 
What? Of course not. I had no reason to be mad at Wally. That doesn't really prove anything. That isn't the most interesting evidence we've gathered, though. I had no reason to be mad at Wally. We found your letter to Wally. You had some real feelings for him. Too bad. He just wasn't that into you, huh? Gosh, I know how that can hurt, right? It makes you wish you could sit him down and just talk. Maybe tie him down. So he doesn't go anywhere while you're sharing all those real feelings. Maybe try to change his mind a little with a drink or two or three. Or hell, maybe the whole damn bottle, huh? Isn't that pretty much how it went down, Gary? No, it wasn't like that at all. I loved Miss A. I loved her so much. Let's all just calm down for a second. Why didn't you give Miss A the letter? I just wanted to write down my feelings. For once in my life, I wanted to be honest with myself. She knew how I felt about her. I told her. I said, I love you. And she looked at me, kind of puzzled, and said, It must be so nice to be able to say those words and mean them. And then she walked away from me. I wasn't even sure what she meant. But I had my answer. We would always just be friends. And I could live with that. That's a lovely story, Gary, but will a jury believe it? If you're innocent, you better start answering our questions. All of them. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you whatever you want. Why would I have an apron? Doesn't make sense. I'd never even seen that apron before. Four months later, Muskie's found dead in his car off Barber Street. Lon Muskie, is that his name? I never asked. Sure, I beat him up, but he deserved it. He would take my friends out on dates, and, and they would come back bruised, sometimes bleeding. I wanted to teach him how to treat a lady in a language he would understand, but I didn't try to kill him. He should have gone to jail, but that detective, she let him go. But what can you expect, huh? You guys look out for each other, and I can't blame you. What do you mean, we look out for each other? Do you mean we cops look out for each other? Muskie wasn't a cop. No, you guys, you know, black people. I'm sorry, I mean African Americans. Oh, now I've gone and put my foot in my mouth. I just... Well, that's what happened, okay? That black lady detective showed up and let him go. I don't remember exactly what she looked like. I remember that her badge surprised me. I'd never seen a black woman detective before. Wait a second, you're saying Detective Warries Briggs knew this guy and just let him go because she was black and he was black? Is that the load of bull you're trying to sell us about one of the most distinguished officers this department has ever known? Please, I'm only telling you what I remember. I'm not making anything up, I swear. Maybe it wasn't just a black thing. Come to think of it, the way they argued, maybe they knew each other. She did say she was giving him a ride home. I mean, I think. It was a really long time ago. Setting aside Mr. Beaumont's racial insensitivities, I think we need to take a better look at Detective Briggs' involvement in all of this. You want to know what I think? I think this guy's a lying sack. This is a photograph of Lon Muskie from the Barber Street Murders case file. Is this the man you assaulted? No, that's not the guy. I mean, I'm sure I'd remember him. And that's not him. That's strange. But take a look at this photograph, then. This is another Barber Street boozer victim. His name is Matthew Dawes. Is this the man? That's him. That's the guy that hurt my friends. Matthew Dawes. If what you say is true, why would Juarez write a different name in her notes? Did I hear Ray right? Detective Briggs's personal case notes were wrong? She must have known the victim was named Matthew Dawes. I hate to say it, but 
I think we need to get to the bottom of her involvement in all this. I can't believe it. And I'm not just saying that because I think this Beaumont guy's lying to us. Even if he were telling us God's honest truth, retired Detective Warris Briggs is one of the most dedicated and well-respected officers to ever serve in Las Vegas law enforcement. Hey. No judge is going to permit you to compromise her rights without some very compelling evidence. The name of the victim was written in different ink. These notes were altered after the fact to remove all trace of Matthew Dawes's name. I can't believe she deliberately tried to mislead us, but the evidence speaks for itself. Okay, I'll go with you to serve the warrant. Why don't you take Nick along, too? Another pair of eyes won't hurt. What's going on here, Jim? We need to talk, Warries. You gotta tell me what's going on. You changed your case notes. You omitted the fact that you knew Matthew Dawes. Why did you do that, Warries? There's no way I can help you unless you tell me the whole truth. Jim, you've got a lot of nerve coming in here like this. Like I'm some sort of common criminal. I gave my life serving this city. I demand some damn respect. Hmm. It's a shrine. I've known some cops who could never let go of some cases, but not like this. I never would have pictured you in pink, Worries. Worries knew this Dawes guy all right. Looks like they were more than just acquaintances. Whoa, is this the right RV? Barber Street area. More Barber Street boozer paraphernalia, nothing we don't already have. She is technically entitled to have one of these. The truth? Now that's funny. You go on, take a look around, take what you need, and then get the hell off my property. Hey, I'm off the clock, but if you guys need a hand, count me in. The Barber Street Boozer is a part of Vegas history. If he's back, then I want to be there when we take him in. Thanks, Greg. We can use all the help we can get. Maybe we'll have better luck with a different magnification. Yep, the fiber we found in Detective Briggs' trailer matches the apron found in the dumpster. Now what was she doing at that club? What do you need? I know this is tough, Jim. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you. This is very personal to me. And I'm not gonna do anything to impugn the reputation of Detective Briggs. So if you don't start bringing me some indisputable physical evidence that puts her in that club, killing Biganowski, 
then I'm not gonna do a damn thing for you on this one. Are you sure this is right? Okay. So the fiber from the apron puts Detective Briggs at the crime scene. I don't know. If you weren't the one asking, I'd say go back and try again. But I'll see what I can do. I'm not promising anything. In fact, I hope the judge turns us down. Detective Briggs, we found the victim's blood on an apron behind the club. A thread from that same apron was in your home. That's why you brought me in? I probably had the same kind of apron at some time. That's no evidence. How dare you accuse me of this? Worries, I may be the only friend you have right now. You have the right to talk to your lawyer, but you and me, we're cops. I know where you're coming from. Talk to me. Just because I carried a badge doesn't make me your sister, Jim. You have no idea where I come from or what I've been through. I'm sorry, we'll need to swab the inside of your mouth. You go right ahead and do your job then. Matthew Dawes? No, who's that? He was a victim of the Barber Street Boozer. Gary Beaumont seemed to think you had shown Mr. Dawes preferential treatment in an earlier altercation. Gary Beaumont is a criminal. You're gonna take his word over mine? I don't know any Matthew Dawes. We found a photo of you and Matthew together. You were obviously close. If you already knew that, why'd you ask the question? I told you, I heard about this on the news, same as everyone. I never saw the victim before. DNA under Biganowski's fingernails matches Detective Briggs. I can't believe a cop would kill someone like that. She was a hero in the department. I'm not looking forward to that press conference. I guess this means the Barber Street boozer remains on the loose. Or maybe he's just passed into legend. Greg, we're not done with Detective Briggs yet. She may still hold the answer to the boozer case. I never saw the victim before. We found your DNA under the victim's fingernails. It's over, Waris. We have all the evidence we need to charge you. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you kill this man? Why were you even in that club that night? Have you ever lost someone you truly loved? Grief is like a cancer. Matthew Dawes was my fiancé. He was the Barber Street Boozer's third victim. He was the only man I ever really loved, with my body and soul. But the man struggled with a sickness, with a disease. You're trying to say he was gay. That's not a disease, Worries. It's a sin and a sickness. But we were working it out. We were praying, and we would have beaten this thing together. I know we would have. But then that monster took him away from me. Do you mean Floyd Collister? 
Hell yes, Floyd Collister. He was the boozer. How long have you suspected that Floyd was the Barber Street boozer? I don't suspect it. I know it. I had looked at Floyd for the killings before, more than once. I could never make it stick. Honestly, from talking to him, I didn't think he had it in him. I'd even been to that freak show club of his a few times, but I never saw anything like I did last night. I was just sitting in the back, watching for Collister or Beganowski or Beaumont, anyone on the list. No one paid me the least bit of attention, and then I noticed Floyd Collister walk in. It was hard to recognize him without the makeup and the dress, but there he was. And he was one mean son of a bitch for a change. Drunk, screaming at everybody. He even jumped all over Gary for going behind the bar and opening up a special stash of classic cork he was saving. Floyd started threatening Gary. You want a drink? I'll give you a drink. How about you drink until the black stuff starts oozing out your damn nose, you dirty old queen? That's when I knew, after all these years, I knew in my heart, in my gut, it was Floyd Collister. It was Floyd all along. He was the monster. It was Floyd all along. He killed Matthew. It wasn't revenge. It was justice. Justice? What the hell are you talking about, Waris? What's happened to you? I'm a cop, Jim. What's happened to me? I never stopped working the case. That's what's happened to me. Even after they forced me off of it, threatened to transfer me, I never let it go. It was personal, don't you get it? That disgusting creature murdered the best man I've ever known. I had to take him down. I knew I didn't have enough proof, but I didn't need it. I waited, put up with that awful damn music, until closing time. I was the last one left. Floyd came out in that ridiculous dress to tell me the place was closed. I acted like I was leaving, but when he turned his back, I hit him with a hammer fist to the back of the head, knocked him clean out. I may be old, but I can still take down a perp. I tied him up with an apron from behind the bar, opened up a bottle of classic cork, and started pouring it down his throat. He was slurring drunk by the time he woke up. I almost wished I'd held back a little, so that he could have appreciated his situation a little better. How did your DNA get under his fingernails? I got careless, let him grab me while I was coming in with a fresh bottle. Not that he could hold on to me by then. He just kept whining, not me, not me, crying like a damn baby. I bet Matthew didn't cry, you filthy bastard. Floyd Collister didn't perform last night. You killed his understudy, Wallace Biganowski. That's impossible! I saw him go backstage! I saw him go back there and come out dressed as a woman! I saw him! Detective, I think you were right when you said grief is like a cancer. Your fiancé wasn't sick, but you are. And now you'll have to pay for your sin as well. Oh God, what have I done? I killed him! Not me! Oh God, no! No! Is there anything you can tell us that might help us put away the bruiser? I don't know. I can't. The hairs. Did you ever get any of Collister's DNA? Did you try running it against the hairs from the crime scene? I tried, maybe 15 years ago, but there just wasn't enough there for a sample. But your lab already found one impossible sample from that skin flake. I went through the cold case evidence very thoroughly. There was no hair. There's got to be. I checked it into Central Property myself. I'll go to Central Property, but in the meantime... Waris Briggs. You're under arrest for the murder of Wallace Biganowski. Walris was right about that hair. It was in a separate folder, but otherwise exactly where it was supposed to be. They just missed it when they sent over the rest of the Barber Street Boozer file.
Whoa. Marcel is the Barber Street boozer? Unbelievable. I've got to put this in my book. Brass better be ready for the press conference of his career. Hey. Do you have enough evidence? It's the last call for Floyd Collister. I'll pick him up. Haven't I made it abundantly clear that Floyd Collister is but a distant memory? He might as well be dead and buried. Don't you think it's unhealthy to obsess about the past? There's nothing we can do to change it. It is what it is. You know the problem with the past is it's never past. We have your DNA, Marcel. We know you murdered those boys. I did, didn't I? And no matter how hard I try, I will never escape him. He's always a part of me. Even though, truly, Captain Brass, I am not Floyd Collister. Not anymore, anyway. Marcel wishes with all her heart that she could change what happened. But you cannot choose your destiny. Life's a bitch. I shall confess to all the unfortunate and dreadful details, Captain. But I shall refuse to my dying breath to say I killed Wally because I absolutely did not. I may have broken his heart, but I would have never extinguished his soul. I only left out a few minor details. Like removing the apron and chair? Oh, I don't know. They seem to obviously bring the boozer to mind, and I didn't want anyone to make the association. You can't run from your past. I never thought of it as running. I chose to think of it as metamorphosis. Perhaps even redemption. I was reborn as Marcel. All that rage and fear was gone. I was free, and for 35 years I was bathed in love. Oh, what a glorious ride. Mars, Floyd Collister. You're under arrest for the murder of Matthew Dawes, Lon Muskie, Gus D'Souza. Congratulations on a job very well done. Not only did we solve a celebrity case, we closed a cold case as well. Eckley couldn't be more pleased. I realize you've only been with us for a short time, but you're a true professional. It's funny, I was just thinking the other day how you remind me of a criminalist who used to work with us, Wart Brown. You have his fire. Don't ever lose that. Anyway, you're a great asset to the team. I hope you're with us for a long time. Now go home and get some rest. <laughs>